Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Welcome to another episode of the Truth of Therapy Sessions, episode 57. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to have a special call-in session. I've had uh, plenty of people reach out to me after a few of my live call-in shows, uh, off-the-cuff random sessions where I just get random people to come on and share their stories. And quite a few people have reached out to me and said, you know, can I come on and share my story? And I thought no better time to do this than in a therapy session of sorts. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun today, guys. Um, obviously, usually I get quite a lot of guests from other channels on here as well, but I do think every now and then I want to mix it up a bit and actually do a more of a grounded, down-to-earth talking to just everybody, uh, truth of therapy sessions as well, and that's what we're going to get done today. So today I have a uh, one guest, first of all, who's going to share for an hour called Russell. Uh, and then later, I've got an individual called Louis coming on as well, who wants to talk about his thoughts and theories and ideas surrounding the millennial reign, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Louis, you're in the Telegram there. I've just sent you a message if you're listening. So just let me know, OK? But right now I've got Russell with me. He's on the line and he has quite the tale to tell, I believe. Russell, how are we doing? I am doing well, Paul. Thank you for inviting me on the show and allowing me to have an opportunity to share some experience, strength, and hope. Yeah, absolutely. No, not a problem at all, Russell. Thanks for reaching out to me. And thanks for coming on to do this. I know it's uh, it can be a bit daunting for people because uh, no, these live shows do seem to get quite a lot of views these days. And um, as I always as I said just before we began, uh, take a breath. Don't worry too much about it. You're just talking to me. Okay, like this is me and you having a conversation. Uh, so so tell me. Russell, uh, you've you've obviously sent me a lot of uh, a long messages telling your tale, and it's hard to really know where to begin. It sounds like it's a lot. It's a long journey of uh, self discovery, uh, trauma, heartbreak, a roller coaster ride of ups and downs, and learning and growing in faith and spirituality and truth. It's um, and I think a lot of people could probably value a lot from your story, to be honest. Which is why I'm happy to have you here. So I'll leave it with you, uh, Russell. I'm sure you've probably told this story yourself, maybe many times in writing. So. Tell me, what do you want to talk about today? I, I appreciate the introduction, Paul. Yeah, I guess I do get kind of rambly with my with my messages, but um, I don't know. I, I do think that sometimes uh, God will pluck some of us out of the the misery and drudgery of the you know our own destitute that we put ourselves into, and hopefully mm -hmm. we can be a mouthpiece for His message. I. Uh, do have a, a kind of a sordid past and uh, a rather cavalier history. I I grew up in a, a small little sleepy town in, in Tennessee in the 80s and the 90s. And um, a grandmother that was extremely uh, evangelical Christian. And I, I didn't exactly grow up in a household that was um, really practiced the faith. I mean, you know, we went to church on Sundays and stuff, but um I don't know. I, it, it wasn't really practiced in my household. Uh, me and my sister were kind of left to fend for ourselves and kind of raised ourselves. And, you know, that, that really led to an opportunity for us to have a lot of free time on our hands. And, um, it, needless to say, I, I uh, filled a lot of my free time with, uh, with, with chemicals and substances and partying and, um, you know, I was like diagnosed with ADHD at a very young age and they put me on chemicals from a, a very early time, put me on Ritalin and you know, other, other types of downers to help me go to sleep. And I don't know, from that point on, I, um, I just had an affinity with, uh, you know, with partying. That was, that was just what you do in, <laughs> uh, in boring little country towns. And, um, mm -hmm. But I do remember that my grandmother prayed over me a lot. That was one of the, the things that she told me all the time was that she was always pleading the blood of Christ over me. And, you know, so I, I felt like I had a, a real close connection with uh, with Christ and with the Lord. But I, I don't know. I never really took it all that seriously. And you know, we'll, we'll just plant that seed and come back around to it. Because um, at one point in time in my life, I after having to lose a I haven't have to loss a, a couple of friends to uh, some tragic events in my youth. Uh, I, I just really didn't. I just really didn't take the whole God and Jesus thing all that seriously. Uh, and I, I, I do think that I was searching for somewhat of a spiritual connection, and um, I found it in trying to, you know, search that out through taking hallucinogenic substances. You know, I had a, some friends that were partiers and got into the rave scene. And 
uh, it, you know, I took a lot of substances that, you know, they, they were just great, you know, acid and mushrooms and smoking weed and, you know, just a kind of a, a chemical garbage can, if you will. Oh, yeah. And uh, that persisted for that persisted for a while. I um, I left Tennessee when I turned 18 and uh, I, I traveled around the southeast for a little while. Um, I wound up I wound up in Orlando, Florida. And uh, uh, right before I went into the army, I had you know, two big experiences that, um, uh, you know, I just knew that, hey, my life is on the wrong track. I think um, <laughs> I called my mom up one night after having overdosed for the second time in two weeks. And I told her mom, I think I'm, I think I'm going to die if I keep on the same track that I'm in. She was like, well, I'm not going to give you any money. But if you can find your way back up to my house, um, I'll let you sober up here and you got to go in the army. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> that's my choice. Like, death or the army. Great. Um, it, so long story short, I, I did find myself back to her house and uh, uh, got sobered up to the to the point that I could and you know, made it into the army. And I did really well. I did really well in the army. Um, I was in basic training when the Twin Towers fell. And that was a really crazy experience because the, uh, you know, the drill sergeants got real intense after that because, yeah, it, it was all just, you know, hey, uh, people joined up for getting college money and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you, you're about to you got to earn your college money there, kid. Um, and and that, that got really intense. I, uh, I don't know. Though, I loved it. I, I loved the, the structure of the army. It really turned me around, mm. turned me into the man that I am today. I, uh, you know, I was a paratrooper for the 82nd Airborne Division, and I volunteered to go to Afghanistan. I got married in the, was in the Army Married Couples Program, and my wife was a counterintelligence agent, and she got pregnant with our first child, and then we started invading Afghanistan. I volunteered to go, and she was like, no, you're not going to do that, man. <laughs> she <laughs> showed up to my company one day with a colonel and was like, yeah, he's a he's got a child on the way and there are other kids that can go do his job. I didn't get to go, but I was a little bit salty about that, but I didn't have a couple of friends that came back and the friends that did come back were like, you know what, you're Russell, you, it was okay. <laughs> you, you really didn't want to go over there. It's not what it was, uh, what it was all cracked up to be. Mm-hmm. And I wound up getting injured in a, in a jump. And, uh, that, that kind of turned my life around because, um, had a parachute collapse on me and like really messed up my back, got a head injury from it. And that opened up an over decade love affair with opiates that, uh, didn't end until about 2014. Um, so, and and then over the past, over the course of that decade, I was chronically homeless, like couldn't hold a job, just bounced around the whole United States. And, um, I don't know, man, I, I had my, uh, I, I got chaptered out of the army. I got to take care of my daughter for about seven years and raised her as a single father. And, uh, you know, through the whole time, I just still had that big hole inside of me. I became a staunch atheist. You know, my, my wife wound up going to Iraq for a year and a half with her boyfriend and, uh, she wound up getting pregnant over there. We got a divorce. Um, it, it, you know, is it, it just, it just kept like, it just kept feeling like, one thing after another, after another, just broke me down spiritually and mentally. And, um, the only solace that I could find was in chemicals, you know, self-medication. Mm. Um, it, it was, yeah, it, it was, it, it was a lot of, a lot of self-deprecation as well and self-loathing. And I finally wound up in, in Las Vegas of all places. And, uh, when I was in Las Vegas, uh, there was, uh, what was this stuff? There was this chemical that they were probably spraying on hamster shavings. It was this stuff called spice that you could buy at convenience stores. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I smoked this stuff one time and I was, uh, uh, I was looking over the, uh, I was on a, uh, I was on a balcony overlooking the strip in Las Vegas where you could see the Luxor. And I'd just taken a pickle hit of this stuff and I've never experienced anything like this before in my life, but all of a sudden it was like ripping through the veil, being able to just, you know, it was at nighttime and all of a sudden this, uh, what I can only describe is this 
giant figure that seemed to be laying down. Its head was at least the size of the Luxor and its feet went all the way clear out to the mountains. And I thought, wow, this is, <laughs> this is new. This is interesting stuff. Mm. Um, and then the head like rolled over and stared at me and, uh, I, I, I hit it one more time and then this, and then it started to roll towards me and I was like, you know what, this is enough. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go inside. Uh, this, this is getting a little strong. And then I had a, uh, I sat down on the couch and was watching TV and then these, uh, this set of lips just, uh, uh I can only describe it as this, this like lizard like lips they were really sexy looking with this serpent like tongue, like materialized out of the TV and started talking to me, like calling my name and telling me how amazing I was and how, you know, beautiful I am and all this weird stuff. And I was like, okay, oh my, <laughs> this is crazy. And, uh, I, I, I don't know. I've never felt that much dread before in my life because I really felt like I was losing my mind. Mm-hmm. And, um, I went and laid down on the bed with, uh, uh, the mother of my two youngest children and this set of lips just kept on following me around and it would materialize right out of the wall and keep on just talking to me, saying my name and just trying to, you know, say all these wonderful, sweet, caressing things into my ear. And I finally just, you know, I reverted back to something that my grandmother had told me is if you're ever, you know, if you're ever in trouble, call upon the name of the Lord and he will, he, he will bring you into safety. And I just, I, I didn't know what to do because every time I told it to stop, it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't leave me alone. And then I called on the name of Jesus for some reason. And all of a sudden, poof, it, it stopped. And I went back out and I looked out on the strip and it was gone. And I was like, huh, that's, that's fascinating. Um, hmm. uh, I, I would like to say that that was the night that I got sober, but it wasn't. Uh, it was about, about a good another year and a half uh, before I did finally find it in me to, um, uh, to say this is, this is enough, you know, this, this is, uh, I've, I've had enough. Um, yeah. And that was after, uh, you know, a, a very horrible bout of heroin in in Las Vegas. And then, uh, I don't know, I just, I, I finally found a reason to, uh, to get sober, check myself into the VA and, um, and then started going to AA meetings. And, uh, that was August 6, 2014. I'll be celebrating 10 years of sobriety August 6th of this year, which is kind of crazy and, and amazing because life definitely turned around for me from that point on. Um, mm. But what I, so there's, there's, you know, a little, little bit of my story uh, just you know, kind of wanted to outlay a little bit that I, you know, I have a lot of experience with different substances that, you know, you see things when you're on hallucinogens and, especially if you're hallucinating, you see things that are there that you, you really don't know if they're there or not. And I, I, I'll say that I've only had like three experiences where I took something that really made me question my reality, but also, you know, I saw things that now that I'm sober and I've had uh, an opportunity to get into the scriptures and to get closer with God, because it was only... It, and I tell you, Paul, I don't know if, if you, you know, what your drug of choice was, or I've heard you say that you had some, you know, some experiences and some bouts and battles with, with substances in your past. And that mm-hmm. that's kind of how you came to, came to the Lord. Um, I, I, I was hopelessly and helplessly addicted to substances that I just could not stop craving. I, mm-hmm. um, you know, for the life of me, I could not go a day without thinking about wanting to get high. And I was going to AA meetings and I was getting around people that had 20 and 30 years of sobriety. And they were like, just keep on coming back. Don't don't stop until you get the miracle. And I'm like, I can't really relate to you because you've been sober for three decades. And I just want to know how to make it to tomorrow without mm-hmm. thinking about wanting to get high. And uh, and they were like, have you thought about just praying to God? Like, <laughs> Yeah, right. Pray to God. You guys talk about that all the time. And so I went home one night and I said, you know what? I'll give it a shot. If this whole God thing is real, if you're real, give me a day, give me 24 hours where I don't think about getting high one single time. And then I'll, you know, I'm all in. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. 
I'll, I'll do whatever it takes to follow this whole God idea. If you can give me 24 hours without thinking about putting something in my body to change the way that I think or feel about how things are going or who I am. And uh, the very next day, I went 24 hours without thinking about it one time. I had the greatest day that I've had in probably a year and a half. Spent a wonderful, you know, wonderful time with my son, who was just a few months old. And uh, his mom was like, wow, you seem to have had a really good day. How'd it go? It's like, you know, it was a really good day. And my sponsor talked to me the next day. He said, well, uh, <laughs> you've been struggling, man. How was your day? I, uh, you know what? I went a whole day without thinking about getting high. He's like, and it was because you, ah, and it dawned on me because huh. I, because uh, I, I prayed to God. Mm-hmm. And the next thing I know, I, um, you know, I, I might as well have been at every meeting with pom poms in my head. Give me a G, give me an O, give me a D. What's it spell? It's the answer for you. Uh, it, yeah. It, um, the first year was rough, but uh, it, I don't know. I, uh, I definitely figured out that something created me something created this reality and if he did it probably left some messages behind for us probably has some ideas about how things are supposed to go what he expects of us what he doesn't expect of us and if god is in control then i guess you know if he isn't in control then i guess nothing matters i've experienced that life it it it, it was horrible and it sucked but if he is in control then nothing else really matters and I kind of devoted my life to trying to figure out what does he want. And I did recall reading in the scriptures a few things about him warning about pharmacopoeia, uh, sorcery, you know, not p- putting yourself in a position where the spirits can um, entice you. You know, don't seek them out. Don't mm-hmm. uh, what, however you want to call it. Right. Don't do drugs. Like, this is the moral <laughs> of the story. Right. Um and I don't know, I've, uh, after having done some several drugs in seven different geographical areas of the world, I want to say that there were only a couple of places where I, uh, I saw things that I guess were just, uh, I don't know, the, the disembodied spirits or the Nephilim, the whatever you want to call them, the, the machine elves, you know, things that, um, that I saw that I just thought I was kind of crazy for seeing them. Uh, I remember one time taking some acid before I went into the army and every time that I would use the restroom, I would see in the water of the toilet or in the water of the, uh, uh, the sink, I would see the, the typical gray alien face, like just the eye and the, and the head Mm -hmm. looking back at me. I thought, "Hmm, that's weird. Um, and I don't know. I had, you know, one other experience where I had, uh, I was with my girlfriend at my farm in Tennessee and we had like pitched a tent and we were just sitting talking on a hilltop, uh, babbling on. And in the background on the fabric of the tent, like behind her, I saw the, the God, the God Anubis was just like circling around her and behind me were these weird demonic faces that were just like coming out at me and screaming at me and you couldn't hear them. You know, it was just visualizations. And, uh, you know, so I wonder, if maybe, I don't know, maybe where based on where you are in the world, uh, if you do take these substances, if it's, you know, there's more of a concentration for them, if they're, mm. I, I don't know, I don't know how the spiritual world works. You know, I don't know if they're more concentrated in one geographical spot more than the next, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe my story can be a little bit of experience, strength, and hope of, um, don't, take substances that, uh, you know, will allow you to see them because for some reason they can see you when Mm. you're a little bit thinner in the veil, (laughs) you know, maybe maybe there's a sparkle around you and they know, Hey, you might be open to uh, a little bit of suggestion and a little bit of attack. And, uh, you know, having experienced and felt what that, you know, having felt that, um, maybe that's what I wanted to talk about today. You know, don't do drugs, but if you're going to do it, uh, you know, your last resort is calling the Lord because it really does work. God is real. <laughs> Tested <laughs> it and it works. Yeah, I mean, your story in many ways has parallels to my own as I was listening to you talk there. Um, it sounds like you went through the, the thick of it more than I did in terms of addiction and things like that. I mean, um, 
compared to compared to you you know my stuff was pretty harmless <laughs> by comparison uh, i was blessed and lucky that the the worst addiction i had was nicotine you know um and oh. he- and heavy cannabis use um but i wouldn't say i was a addicted to that necessarily i suppose you get used to the routines and you get addicted to the feeling but in terms of chemical i, I don't think it is addictive um, but that was eight years of my life doing that constantly every day non-stop um, so be, so I, I wasn't sober for 10 years of my life uh, because of that and um, i did dabble heavily into psychedelics as i got into my later teens and early 20s for a good four years of my life i was pretty much tripping every single day or every other day trying to get the harder, more powerful things I could get, like uh, psilocybin or dimethyltryptamine, things like that. Um, tabs of acid was a regular thing. Um, I did do MDMA quite a lot, a lot of the uppers, speed, speed things like that. Um, I did dabble slightly in, um, in cocaine, but it wasn't a regular thing, and it's not something I ever purchased for myself. It was just one of those things that was always around at parties and people were just giving away, you know. Um, so that, that was sure. on occasion, but I was lucky that I never, it never became a habit because I was doing my, I was doing my, um, my conscious. Well, the reason I did these things was first of all, the minor medica- self-medication was to run away from my problems and to just not have to deal with the now and constantly, well, not have to deal with the future or, or think about the past. So I could just always be in the now. And I think being there made me basically waste 10 years of my life where nothing progressed but nothing changed either or got worse or or better if you get what i mean um Mm -hmm. so that was one reason why i I self-medicated with cannabis Um, it wasn't for fun necessarily it was to to forget and to deal with with i suppose traumas and things of the past and and um fears rather than having to deal with the fear it was an escape um, as for the psychedelic use, that was actually a sincere attempt by me to try and understand what was going on in the spirit realm. It was more of a, um, an experiment rather than, a, again, it wasn't fun for me. Um, I'm curious from your story, you know, you sounds like you got into this not really through any choice of your own. You kind of fell into it through a series of unfortunate events, first rebellion at a young age, and then it, from the sounds of it, uh, suffering extreme pain and heartbreak and misery which led to a strong addiction um, due to needing to heal from physical damage. So that I, I understand that's quite a big one for a lot of people. Do you want to maybe explore that concept a bit more? Could you tell me what was your driving factor throughout your entire life to even get into drugs to begin with? Because for many, it's it's an alien topic and world, you know, so I think it might be good to give some insight. Sure. Okay. Um yeah, it, uh, I, I've definitely thought about that. I, so I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a town. I'm, you know, I'm a redhead, and where I grew up, there weren't very many of us around. And in the time frame that I grew up, it was, it was like a country town, and I didn't really fit in with, uh, you know, with a lot of my peer groups. Uh, I started, you know, I started taking dance, and I did gymnastics and dance when I was younger, and. Um, dance when I was in like seventh grade, all the way up through high school. Mm. Um, you know, I was actually a dance instructor and, uh, did competitions and stuff like, you know, like, uh, at any rate, I was picked on a lot because of that. Um, because that just wasn't really considered very cool or manly. Mm. Uh, it, you know, I, I, I don't have any, uh, I, I don't have any homosexual predilections, but I had a lot of friends that you know, were like that, but it just never was my gig, but I was picked on a lot because of that. Um, and it, it, I don't know. I just, I never really fit in and I fought all the time. Like it was just, it was a constant thing of having to fight people just because of the way that I looked or who I was or how I decided to live my life. And that, you know, there was a lot of pressure with that, right? There was, um, a lot of trauma that I guess that came with that, uh, and, and so like, I, you know, I think that, that definitely helped, <laughs> it, you know, uh, propel me towards wanting to do substances, just not to think about what the next day might entail. Um, I had a really close friend of mine that, uh, was, was killed in a motorcycle accident when we were in ninth grade. He was like a brother to me and, uh, he, he was hit by a a mom in a minivan that had had one too many glasses of wine to drink. And, Mm. uh, that, that was pretty traumatic. I, um, 
started drinking really heavily in ninth grade after that. And then um, when I was in my junior year, when I was 16, <laughs> this is great. My, uh, uh, my parents really didn't, you know, like I said, they left me to fend for myself. And uh, my dance instructor, who I also worked for, uh, she was 20 years older than me. She um, she wound up seducing me, <laughs> and huh. I was in a relationship with her for three years. And having a woman that's 20 years older than you, um, you know, she it, it, it was understood what my role was in that relationship. And um, one of the ways that she seduced me was by getting me inebriated, and she gave me a safe place to go and party at at, at night. And um, you know, so sex, drugs, rock and roll, dance. She would take me out of town to dance conventions and we, you know, share hotel room over the weekend. And it was, uh, that was a weird thing, right? Like not many people that I knew experienced anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just never really, you know, I couldn't really relate with people of my own age after that. Um, I, uh, it, you know, so that was, I didn't realize until I got older, like much older that, you know, that she was, that was a pedophile. That was, you know, 36 year olds don't typically seek out 16 year old young boys and date them. And it, it, you know, um, mm. that, that's not a, a real regular thing that happens. Um, but it, you know, it was just my life. I didn't, you know, I didn't, really didn't, I thought that it was pretty cool. As a matter of fact, I was like, uh -huh, look at me. I'm, I'm really something, I guess this older woman likes me and, uh, wants to be with me. Now that I'm almost 45, I, I just can't imagine wanting to be with a child that's sickening to me. But um, mm. anyways, that was my life. And uh, uh, I think that really contributed as well to a lot of the confusion and just, you know, just trauma. And uh, if you don't really want to confront what your life is like, it's a whole lot easier to just drink those questions away and smoke weed and, mm. you know, uh, not have to worry about it. Um, Absolutely. A lot of my, a lot of my friends that I, that I partied with, uh, you know, we would, we would go down we were only about an hour and a half away from Memphis and Memphis is a, a place where you can find anything that you want. And, you know, so we, I enjoyed, I, I just enjoyed tripping. I loved acid. I loved microdots. I loved, you know, I, I loved the feeling that it brought to me and so, it, you know, that was something that I sought out a lot as well. Uh, but the, 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 it, I guess the pain aspect, because opiates really wasn't my drug of choice until I was injured. And then after, you know, after getting out of the hospital and them just throwing Percocets at me, uh, when I was in the army and having this unlimited supply of Percocets, and I loved opiates, the, the warm, fuzzy feeling that it gave to me. Um, I just couldn't get enough of it. And uh, even like, so after I got out of the army, uh, I wasn't really addicted to them after I got out of the army until I had another incident when I was in, uh, I was down in Florida and I wound up hurting my back again. And because of my, you know, because of my medical history, it was real easy for me to get, uh, for me to get prescribed opiates. And this was at a time in Florida where you could, I mean, you know, all you got to do is just show up at a pill mill with an, with an MRI and you can get 300 rocks a set 30s a month and 180 15s for breakthrough pain. And mm -hmm. you can bring a friend and get the same amount. And next thing you know, you know, you're shooting synthetic heroin and I was able to get the most that a, they could prescribe to a human being legally. And that was, that was horrible. That, that pain aspect was, um, uh, that, that led to a lot of misery in my life because once you get on, you know, once you get on those synthetic opiates and the synthetic heroin, uh, it, it, I don't know, it, it's just a miserable existence because mm. I had never really experienced what it was like to be dependent on something until getting on those pills and then one, and then having them dry up <laughs> because, uh, it, it seems like for about six months or so, I, it, you know, they were just, it was like a flood of them came through Florida. And then, um, the DEA started cracking down and not prescribing them to anybody in pharmacies, wouldn't allow you to fill prescriptions. And then next thing you know, you can't get anything. 
And so what do you do? You, you can't be dope sick. You can't just, you know, that's miserable laying in bed all day and not being able to move and, you know, your restless leg syndrome and just having to try and sleep for 18 hours a day and can't function. And that, uh, yeah, that, that was miserable. I, um, mm. I was fortunate enough to get on Suboxone at one point, but the, the whole pain aspect is so wicked. Uh, I, I really do think that for whatever reason, um, this 6,000 year old adversarial genius that we've got up against this knows what, uh, it just seems to know how to put its clinches and its claws into us with these chemicals. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if that answers your question. Um no, yeah, I would it say, man, if you're if if you if you're experiencing pain, by all means, if you have to go the chemical route, try and go the the THC route if anything because that you, know, you if you find yourself dependent on that, at least you can break out of it pretty mm-hmm. easily. The the opiates is so miserable. God, it's so miserable. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like I I I imagine no, the way you described it there is, you know, Satan uses these things to get you. It's kind of, in a way, it's kind of like a mock Holy Spirit, isn't it? To be filled with this warm, fuzzy feeling, as you described it, which is going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you, you know. And in a way, God offers an alternative to that that will bring you, give you life instead of death, you know. So that analogy is quite apt, to be honest. And, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that story. Again, it does sound like, it, like because I was quite young when I started getting into this world as well. I was only 15, you know. Um, and just, it was just the culture to, to, to smoke cannabis and get into that and, you know, drink and all these type of things. The drinking age in England is a lot lower than it is in America. It's only 18 here. So it was, um, relatively easy to get access to those type of things from a young age. And it's kind of a cultural thing as well. But, uh, it sounds to me like a lot like why I was, it's, it's fun until it's not, it's kind of, um, it starts out as a good time. And then as you get older, it, it always seems to develop into a, a serious habit and it gets further and darker and deeper into into something else eventually where it starts to get spiritual eventually. <laughs> and uh, your story sounds very similar. And um, no, thanks for sharing that. Uh, so so that being said, obviously, you did manage to beat this addiction with through the power of Jesus from the sounds of it and getting to know God, which is fantastic and amazing. Um, but along the way, you know, I, I found personally for me, you know, I wasn't christian either but it it was through the heavy spiritual attacks that came through experimenting with these substances that convinced me that god is actually real and it sounds like from what you were telling me before this you have quite a few supernatural stories to share for yourself so do you maybe want to start sharing with the audience maybe the i don't know the top five or top three or top ten however stories you've got that discuss the, these these experiences with entities from the other side. We've had the we've had the floating talking lips, and that sounded absolutely terrifying. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if I could have coped with that. Um, but uh, those lips you're talking about, I recognize them because that's what I saw um, in a in a vision after I gave up the drugs. It was an enormous, uh, blended black and white jester, kind of blended into this huge psychedelic wall with these enormous purple lips and i think you were describing something similar there um with these huge eyes as well that glowed um but i'll leave it to you and you tell me some of your supernatural stories i'll uh okay i'll just do the top one um the last uh the last acid trip that i had before i went into the army um did a, a took some liquid and it was a lot like a a whole lot. Um, and it was the first time that I'd ever tripped on acid with my sister and she wound up (laughs) saying that she was going to go to bed. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. Um, and this was the first time that I'd ever had like real free form hallucinations. I was in my bedroom. I'm 21 years old. Um, I, I had this little pug this little pug dog otis that i grew up with he's awesome and uh i'm I'm in my bedroom i've got the ceiling fan on and i remember looking at the wall and i had this calendar um and it was this like fantasy type calendar and the the one image that was on it was this fairy that was riding a uh uh dragon and the fan was going so high that it was making the 
calendar like flop, like go out and flop up and, and then come back and hit the uh, and hit the wall. And the dragon's nostrils were like breathing and but like breathing out and flowing down through the wall. And I was like, oh, this is neat. Never seen this before. And uh, I look up at, I, and then I started hearing these voices coming from the ceiling. And I look up and my white ceiling has dissipated and it's just this endless black expanse, what I thought, you know, looked like space. And um, my ceiling fan, the blades on it had turned into these weird tentacle like things. And I could hear them just, and there's this crazy song coming out of the ceiling fan that I, I don't know. It was like, it was just this weird language that I couldn't, that I couldn't understand. And I kind of felt myself being like pulled up into the ceiling and there, and all that I could hear were these voices saying, just come back to us, please come back to us. Don't go, please come back to us. And, uh, and I like shook my head and uh, I remember looking over at my dog Otis and he's just bug eyed looking at me like, dude, <laughs> what is that? And I turn over and I look to my other side and I see this creature that has skin that is the same color as mine, but it's like more like, I don't know what I would, it looked like the, it looked like the skin of a dinosaur from what you would see on like, um, uh, uh what is that show? Um, Anyways, like Jurassic Park, like one of the one of the dinosaur kind of skin. Mm. And I noticed this being just kind of form right up next to me. And I look up at it and it's it's uh, it's very muscular. It's very thin. And it has these, you know, these large eyes, but they're not big black eyes. They're human eyes. Doesn't really have much of a mouth, but it has these very intense eyes and this big bulbous head with what looks like this big brainy looking head and it just looked at me and stared at me and then grabbed me by my hand and took me up through the ceiling. And then it felt like, I don't know, it just felt like lifetimes of being pulled through. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, man. It was like being pulled through these multi-dimensional realities where I was able to go up through the floor of one room and then I would be floating and watching this reality of these people just living out their lives and, you know, different dramas of people living out their lives. And it just felt like going through this maze, this cubicle maze of different people's lifetimes and different people's experiences. I can't remember everything that happened. All I can remember is thinking, this is never going to end. <laughs> Jesus Christ, let, mm. please let it stop. I'm over this. Oh, my God. Am I ever going to get back home? Um and then, I don't know, after what felt like just years of this endless pursuit and just all of this knowledge being dumped into my head, I woke up and I was back in my room again. I was like, oh, yay. Okay. Um, and the, the entity was gone. I, it, it, you know, I, anyways, after that, I do remember having like this, this huge, like spiritual feeling of uh, somewhat enlightenment and I, I don't know. I, I don't know what kind of communication went down between me and that being. I do remember feeling just so like small and it, like it, it, it had this, it, how can I describe it? It had this intent of making me feel so insignificant and then showing me just how insignificant I was in the grand scheme of everything. Like it, I remember at one point in time looking at the ceiling and watching like these billions of little worker ant like people just roaming around like building pyramids and stuff. And, you know, the whole, the, the whole idea of it was, was just basically like you are insignificant, you are nothing. Um, and, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you were to just, if I were to leave you here in this cubicle of other people's lives, no one would miss you. You would not be missed. You would be nothing. Uh, that one kind of stuck with me for, for, for a mm. while. Needless to say, I uh, haven't really experienced much like that, but that was the, that was the biggest one that um, I probably have time to, to expand upon. Yeah. That wow. was a rough one. That's, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> 
absolutely terrifying and um, you know as you described these realms you get pulled through in these things you see I, I get echoes to my own trips you know and i kind of i kind of get the gist of what you were feeling and going through there you know especially that that afterglow feeling you get where you feel like you've gained some something from it but uh it's like a dream it kind of fades away doesn't it it's an odd feeling you try and grasp it and it's like sand through your fingers and it becomes this 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 thing you're trying to get together in your head once more and it's like what 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 wise thing did i learn again what was it you know i understood it clearly while i was there yeah. now i haven't got a clue what it was anymore but i knew it was profound and would have changed the world but never mind it's gone there we go just like a dream but that, that sounds absolutely exactly that sounds absolutely terrifying so this creature did uh, it had reptilian skin and a large head a relatively small if non-existent mouth but large human-like eyes that sounds really creepy was it like slender manish you said it was like thin but muscly like can you give me more details on this creature? right it was uh i mean look, eh, i don't know if i would call it slender manish it was i mean eh, it looked uh, i mean it, it looked almost like a just a very fit slender human being yeah. uh eh, I, I I mean I don't know if I if I could make my body look like that I would definitely have wanted to look like that. I see. Um, and it, it and it was you know it was light flesh colored. Um, it's it, but its head though was uh, I wouldn't say it was like massive and elongated, but it was just it was like this huge brain just kind of popping out of the mm. top of its head. It was it was very it was very intimidating. Needless to say. Hmm. And you got you yeah. got you got the sense that it was malevolence. Is that what you're saying? It wanted to show you you're nothing. Was that the idea from from the experience? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, yeah, there there are times where you know, like it, like you were saying, you you feel like you've been given this this insight into the world, like you've almost cracked the code for flying and levitation, and then yeah. someone offers you a Cheeto, and you're like, ugh. <laughs> I had it. Give me a Cheeto. Um, yeah, it's it's very fleeting. Like you, you know, you yeah. you almost feel like you have to unlock some mystery, and but it's mm -hmm. nothing. You know, it's very fleeting. And like you said, it felt like an eternity while you're in it. Um, but then you can barely remember three seconds of it once you're back. It's kind of, kind of becomes you get the gist of what happened, but you can't really. If only you could take a photo of what you saw. This is how you think think afterwards. It's only only could you could capture in words just exactly what was going on there um but yeah that's, that sounds that sounds pretty pretty intense as, as far as spiritual uh experiences go sure um but is that the only one do you have do you have any more because it sounds like I, I don't i feel like that was probably not your only encounter with the demonic because <laughs> uh, you were quite young when that would happen from the sounds of it right um so let's see <laughs> the I do have one more experience that um, w w was somewhat crazy, and mm. uh, it was uh, I was so I was at the um, it was the last time that I tripped on acid. I was at the the Beale Street Music Festival with my <laughs> with my second ex wife, uh, uh, and she found somebody in downtown Memphis that had some really good acid. We we tripped on it, and um, I've. I got to see John Legend, which was amazing, and Papa Roach and uh, James Brown, his la one of his last performances. It was truly amazing. But I do remember w watching the uh, um, the last performance was John Legend, and the uh, just I don't really know how to how to describe seeing something form in the you know like you're you're in a concert and you're around you know, hundreds of people. Um, and then there's the stage, but then I looked up at the sky and at some point the sky like opened up and they were singing this song, heaven only knows, heaven only knows. And I remember looking up at the sky and watching the, just kind of the sky kind of peel apart, I guess. I, I, uh, it, it was like, it was like watching something, just fingers kind of come mm. through the clouds and through the sky and just ripping open. And then this massive, uh, I don't know. It was like a cloud spirit, I guess. I don't, I don't know what you want to call it, but it was like, it, it wasn't anything like I had seen before. Um, 
just this kind of formless spirit that just came out and I could see it looking down out onto the crowd and uh, it had this huge mouth that just kind of like opened up and like fell right on top of the entire crowd. And it, it was almost like it was just eating up the energy that everybody was sending up. And I, I, that, that was, yeah, that, that was probably the last big one that I remember seeing where um, like, I do not, <laughs> I think this is my last trip. <laughs> this is too much. I, I don't yeah. want to see this shit anymore. This is, this is too much for me. Yeah. Yeah. The, the spirit realm is, is such a terrifying, confusing place because you have all these experiences and this man, these manifestations of it and how we can, can perceive the entities and how they interact with us. You had this working theory that you were telling that you, you think independent geographical locations have specific demons attached to them. Do you want to maybe expand on your theories behind that a little bit more as well? Sure. Okay. So, um, my family farm that we have in Tennessee, uh, on my 19th birthday, I, I was tripping with this, this girl that I, that I met from Sweden. And, uh, I very vividly remember seeing like some type of, a, you know, Egyptian, god the the dog hit it when anubis i guess i remember seeing pictograms of him like swirling around and like free forming in the in the side of the tent fabric um during that trip and one time when i was in florida uh i saw you know like i saw the the faces of the grays when i was in georgia i saw that that one free form thing that took me up into the you know, the matrix of stuff. But when I was in Vegas, uh, I saw the, I saw those disembodied lips and I saw the, uh, the giant. That was the only time that I'd ever seen a giant. And I didn't even know that giants were real. Didn't never even heard of the Nephilim or anything crazy like that before. But I did see this, you know, this disembodied spirit of this massive giant that was took up the entire Valley mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of Las Vegas. And, and I don't, I, I don't know if that has anything to do with the different geographies of where you're at. If, um, if these things just follow you around or if they, you know, as a result of where these beings may have lived before the flood or before they, you know, before, whenever it is that they, that they were, that they were killed. But a lot of the stories that I've heard of giants, they seem to have been prevalent somewhere down in that Las Vegas area, you know, mm. like the Lovelock caves and stuff. Yeah. And, who knows you know who knows who knows what the the map really was before before the flood who knows where these lands what what really inhabited them before mm -hmm. we came here but I, I don't know i just i do feel like maybe there is something to the geography that you're at because the different places that i have been on psychedelics in different geographies there's definitely a different spirit to every place that i've been to and the mm -hmm. most nefarious one was you know the, the most nefarious feeling was there in las vegas that was just it was such a dreadful feeling and the the scariest one that i encountered and mm -hmm. i wasn't even on I, you know i don't even know if you want to consider what i was on a psychedelic or not it was just some stupid spice thing that i picked up at a at a grocery store you know at like a yeah. at a head shop who knows what kind of chemical it was sprayed on um, hamster shavings or something that I smoked. But anyways, it, it definitely opened, you know, it definitely opened that up for, for those entities to come and talk to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe, you know, maybe there could be something to that, you know? Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I don't I know what you've seen where you're at. Well, well, you know, I, I agree with you that it does seem like, um, entities are in some way attached to specific geographical location it really does seem that way i mean if, even if you go into just greek mythology you know and it talks about the meonids and the nymphs and the fauns and the satyrs and these type of things and the meonids and nymphs are basically sirens and sirens it says in the book of enoch where the uh the women who mated with the angels became sirens it's not made clear why exactly or whether it was a punishment from god for what they did but it I think it's more angling towards it was something that was done to them by the Watchers so they could be more um, powerful. It's like a gift from the from the, the, the angels they were sleeping with. It's like, okay, so you're, you're going to mother my children, the Nephilim, so let's make you superhuman. And the Sirens did become like 
fairy-like, half-serpent, half-female godwomen, you know, and one of the most famous sirens is Echidna, um, who was the mother of monsters she was described mm. as, and she had a special golden cave underground where she was kept safe by the gods. And it's, the, the thing is, the nymphs who are these women, these sirens, these ex-humans who were changed, they were allowed to sit in on the meetings of the gods, it said. They were like, they weren't gods, but they were important to the gods, you know. And if you understand these are the wives of the watchers, then it's kind of like the husbands letting the wives sit in on the meetings, you know what I mean? It's kind of, they're all on this, in on the same, they're all in on the same agenda, you know, so why not have them there? And maybe they did, maybe even, maybe even watchers had their wives to get angry at them and they just didn't want to risk it, you know what I mean? Who knows? Who knows what was going on there? But uh, <laughs> the, the point to take from this is that they were actually given dominion over certain places and things like forests, glens, ponds, streams, shorelines, places, geographical locations. There was always like goddesses attached to them, like nymphs attached to them. And it seems like they were only ever interested in like sleeping with human women and spreading the seeds some more or something like that and there's, there's this one myth i think it was in india specifically and it, it's this myth of a, of a bay in india where when there's a full moon this mermaid so a siren a half serpent fish woman creature and um, can become like a human woman during the full moon it takes full fully human form and it said it comes to shore on the full moon and will sleep with the men that are there basically um and then she will recede back into the sea afterwards and won't be seen again till the next full moon and as a reward for allowing these people to do this to her she would then line the shore with pieces of gold like gold nuggets and flakes of gold and stuff like that and it's just it's just such an odd myth isn't it such an odd tale and story until you realize that there was definitely something dodgy going on with genetic mixing they were trying to corrupt the gene the genome of humanity and it's like, kind of like they they still need human genetics to, in order to procreate whatever's going on, you know. Um, it got something got something right. got strange the later on, and these odd tales started to turn up of like giants stealing human women, you know what I mean? Like the city car, for example, that you mentioned there, who died in the Lovelock Caves. You know, these tri this tribe of giants was constantly stealing women from from the neighboring tribes, you know what I mean? And that's what made them get slaughtered and that's what made the humans turn against them and decide we've had enough you know uh, but it, when you said there you know it seems like places have specific demons attached to them maybe there's something to be said for like i said the nymphs all had their own specific forest or something that was theirs and i imagine when they died they still haunt that particular place likely in spirit form if you if you can argue that that the human genetic hybrids who became like Nephilim, also suffered the same fate as the real Nephilim and ended up being stuck on Earth in spirit form once they died too because they corrupted their, their physical form and therefore corrupted the soul as well, you could argue. Uh, so I believe you. I believe that. Um, now, I mean, if you think about the fairy mythos, of the Tuatha Dé Nann, which is an Irish Celtic mythos, mainly in the northern parts of Ireland, they're a very specific type of creature, fairies and gnomes and elves, which you only really find in northern Europe as a mythos. So it seems like that particular area is still dominated by that those particular spirits, perhaps. You know, in all throughout Middle Europe, it's the, the wild, hairy beast man, which you find is the most common seen demon and reported demon of some kind. And the wild man tradition is strong there. Um, if you go to India, it's serpent people. <laughs> you know, they seem to be the most common type of demonic entity. If you go then further from India, when you go a, bit, a little bit more further east, um, it's dragon people and hybrid dragon fanged human people. You know what I mean? It's all different types of serpent cross hybrid, weird beast man hybrids and all these type of things. So, yeah, I, I do think there's something to be said for geographic locations and specific types, variants, shall we say, of Nephilim. Because, uh, you know, the animal kingdom, you can have a species called serpent, 
but the, the the vast variety of serpents out there in the world that we know of, just of the snake kingdom, is is huge. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colours and different different. Some have rattles, some don't. Some have frills, some don't. Like the cobra versus a, and some grow to be like meters long. Others are just tiny little grass snakes. You know what I mean? Like there's a there's a huge variety, and I think it was the exact same thing with these creatures. You know these these demons. So I can believe that and. What you know, I've never been to America, so I couldn't really attest to what type of giants were there. But um, the physical encounters people have discussed have been pale white skin, tall, big wide mouth, cannibalistic redhead giants. Seems to be the norm, the normal description of that region, you know. And perhaps what you saw was yeah. just one of those spirits that is a part of that particular area. I don't know. What what, what did this giant look like specifically? Did you, did you get any details from your memory? <laughs> Yeah, so it um, it was wearing uh, like a headdress. Um, hmm. So it, it, I would I would say that it was wearing more of I don't know. It looked more Egyptian than anything. If I if I if I could you know characterize it to a different civilization, it looked like it was wearing somewhat of a like a, an Egyptian headdress, but it also had you know, like multiple faces too, like mm -hmm. one face that was staring straight up in the sky and then one that was staring right towards me. And then it looked like it had another one because when it started rolling towards me, mm -hmm. I could see three different heads or what, you know, faces to it or whatnot, mm -hmm. but it definitely, I mean, it looked more humanoid than anything, right? Like it, uh, I don't know what, what could I describe it as like Voltron, almost like a Voltron kind of face, <laughs> I guess, but like, you know, three, three faces. I don't know. It, it, yeah. I, I don't really know if that, it, 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 if that describes it as an F1, who knows what they look like. Right. Well, yeah, um, especially but, in the spirit form, I bet they look vastly different now than what they used to in physical form as well. Um, because they're in a psychedelic state really, aren't they? They're not, they're not as physical as they once were. And I think the defining features are quite blurry now and, and meld with the backgrounds and it gets can be, become quite odd. So, uh, you know, I, I'll take any description I can get from people who may have got a glimpse into that realm and I'll take it with seri a serious nature because it's all we can work with. You know, I think we're extremely limited with our perceptions when it comes to the nature of these beings now. But uh, the one defining fact you had there is that it was a giant. That much is clear. And uh, again, I think they were all varying heights some with like skyscrapers some were maybe 10 foot tall <laughs> you know but uh giants is still the main descriptor for what i saw there um okay russell well i think we can be going for about an hour now i do have another guest who's waiting to come on and wants to talk about the millennial kingdom so i, I do think we're gonna have to round this off now um just to close off quickly do you have any like f uh, final statements you want to say maybe the lessons you've learned if you want to try and summarize it maybe in a few oh. minutes and then we'll, we'll definitely have you back on for another call another time if you want to share any more of your stories for sure but we'll just round it off for now if that's okay I've, absolutely paul I've, I've really enjoyed this and if i could if I could close off with anything as a message, if anybody out there that's listening to this, um, you know, feels like, hey, this is something that I want to experiment in and have firsthand knowledge of, I would, uh, I would, I would just go ahead and say that there aren't any um, uh, retirement plans for uh, heroin junkies and <laughs> you know, like uh, old uh, uh, psychedelic heads and. Um, my uh, my wife and I have been to about 24 funerals in the past five years, mm -hmm. and w one of our friends uh, was really depressed and got into psychedelics really hard, was smoking DMT a lot before he decided to uh, take his life. And I would say that um, a lot of what he was trying to do was solve a puzzle and solve a piece of himself, and I do strongly believe because of the things that he said before he left that he was in contact with entities that um were definitely looking at him as a uh as a pawn in this game of chess and he didn't realize that he was also a prize and mm -hmm. um you don't have to take these substances to know that this that they're out there <laughs> that they don't like you and um you know you're you're more precious to your creator than to these entities that uh will try and gift you with whatever special knowledge they you, you think you might be looking for. So don't even try it. It's not worth it. 
Oh, absolutely. I couldn't have put it better myself. You, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, these these entities are liars. They're charlatans. They only seek to kill and destroy you. They're not your friends. I've said that repeatedly, and I think that's a brilliant message to end on there, Russell. Uh, thanks for sharing. I'm going to have to get going because this guy is, has been waiting 10 minutes longer than uh, I promised originally. So uh, we are going to have to get going, Russell. But God bless you, and uh, you take it easy, man. Okay, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Paul. No problem. Bye now. So there we go, guys. Russell's story. That was intense, wasn't it? That guy's that bag, that guy's been through the ringer. Wow. Uh, again, thanks to the guy for sharing his tale there. That's what these truth of therapy sessions are all about. It's about sharing your stories and your your brushes and encounters with the, the nefarious ethereal realm and the the entities there, you know, and how you came to truth and how you hopefully how you found Christ as well. That's always a good way to throw it in there. And that was a story of overcoming addiction. Congratulations to Russell there for being 10 years sober. That is an amazing feat. And you should be you should be proud of yourself. And obviously, uh, praise God for helping you get there as well. That's incredible. So amazing. Thanks for that, guys. So I do have another guest who wants to get on. Um, if he is listening right now, I'm going to send you the link on Telegram to go into our meeting. So we can start this call and uh, you can share with me your uh, theories and ideas. But I am going to just make host a new meeting quickly on Skype here. Uh, you will not need um, any program to join. You just need to click the link and you can join as a guest. And that's all you'll need to do. So I'm going to start the call there, um, Louis, and I'm going to send you the link. There you go. I've sent that to you via Telegram now. So click that Skype link, hop on, and uh, once you jump on, we can, we can get this call started. Uh, but I was just checking back and forth, guys, and naturally the subject matter we were talking about, which is you know talking about the use of drugs, um, that is a no-no for YouTube monetization. So this video is demonetized already. The algorithm picked it up immediately. Um, and I've put in an appeal, but I have very little hope. This is going, this is going to go the other way. So um, if you do want to support this video in any way monetarily to uh, mitigate the, the loss of income from this, I would appreciate a donation. And uh, hopefully, guys, I've you can enjoy the patron. Maybe check that out. I, that's right. I put an advert for myself in the middle while I'm waiting. Why not? It's my channel. But join Patreon for $5 only, and you get access to loads of extra content and behind-the-scenes videos, guys. Um, I've just uploaded the after talk I had with um jt follows jc and alpha talks and um, it's a bit too spicy for youtube we were covering quite a few controversial topics there we just we just cannot discuss on youtube so if you're interested in all the uh the after show conversations that i have with many of my guests you can go to patreon and get access to all of those it's quite a big backlog growing up on there right now I just released the talk I had with Tala from Kingdom Within to all of the uh, free members. You Apparently, it's a new thing now. You can become a free member of Patreon, um, but you don't pay for anything and you don't get access to anything. But you can see what may be available to look at. You don't get any, you can't see the image, they blur it out and they only give you a little bit of text, but you get a glimpse or at least the title of the types of things I'm posting. I did just release to all those free members a 20 minute conversation with Tala, which isn't on YouTube from Kingdom Within. So you can go and enjoy that as well, just to give you a taste of the type of talks we have on there. So go check it out if you haven't already, guys. It's only $5 a month um, and that's, that's the threshold to get access to everything. You can donate more if you like, but that's all you have to pay, guys. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you just checking out that little advert. Hopefully, Louis has figured out how to join Skype. Have we had any luck yet? Not yet. And in the meantime, let's just check the chat, see what's going on. Let's see what you guys are all saying. It seems like we're having quite a lot of heated debates uh, about a lot of things. <laughs> Christianity, theology, uh, substance abuse. Um, yeah, I can see it all. It's never a dull moment in this chat, is it? I have limited it. I put, a, I think, I put a five-second limiter on this time, um, just because it can get a little bit flooded sometimes. Um, so I have put it on, so there's a bit of a bit of a timer this time, um, a bit of a gap, so people can't just spam the chat with whatever they want. Um, it's like Wendy's working hard <laughs> as usual. Thanks for being here, Wendy. I really appreciate it, and, I, and thank you for everything you do for this channel. I re I Honestly, I, I could not do this without you. You are there for every show like a trooper. It's incredible. And I think I am I'm going to have to pay it forward and, and give you give you a a some kind of compensation for this because obviously you do an amazing job for me and I, I really appreciate it. Um 
It looks like we have somebody who still uses cannabis themselves and is trying to come to terms with the the, the spirits of all of this. I hope you figure that out. Um, uh, Resident Properties asks, how many of these masks by these cultures are literally just Satan himself? I understand the variance in myth, etc., but how many people in these cultures know the origins of their aesthetics? That's true. Um, I think many of them could be a representation of 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 Satan, but Satan just means the adversary, and the 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 true adversary of all mankind is the serpent seed, which is the Nephilim, um, and we'll be at enmity with them until the end. You know, <laughs> we're constantly at war with these. That they are our adversary, our enemy. So you could you could say collectively. Uh, Satan, these are a representation of Satan in in a sense that they're a representation of the demon or our, our, our main adversary throughout existence. But of course, Satan himself is a separate entity too. He is a specific um, angel, you know, who has who is rejected God in his first estate. So it, there is that as well. Whether, th whether these masks are just representations of just simply one God, Satan, that's not really what my work has shown. It, the mythos behind these masks is describing a race of entities, plural, usually. So I will just say that, you know, my research hasn't indicated that the, a lot of these masks I show are specifically just about one God. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a representation of a plurality of, of negative malevolent entities, which would have been the oppressive hybrid giants. Um... What else have we got here, guys? Just scrolling through the chat now. Um, it's been spicy, says Sharon Nelson. That's right, yeah. Is anyone here truly convicted that smoking cannabis is a sin? You know what? You know, I, I, I said, as somebody who's, I've done it myself, I don't think it's the herb itself necessarily that is bad and it can have its specific uses, I understand. But um, I, I think it can be so easily abused, so very easily abused to the point where you're not using it for any positive forms anymore. It's using you. And I, I think without a strong relationship with Jesus Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit, you you have very weak defense for when it can take over and eventually create access to the demons to get to you more readily as well. So you have to be prepared for those eventualities as well, which is why we should be extremely careful about these things. Um so I would not promote using any substance at all. I would I would promote sobriety through and through if you can help it. When it comes to pain management, I think that's when it truly has its has its place. You know that you're using it for a specific genuine purpose, and it's in a very natural alternative to the the stuff the pharmacia is really forcing on you through these these pagan witchcraft warlock run <laughs> pharmaceutical industries. You know what I mean. Um, so I would recommend something that just grows naturally out of the ground any day over a chemical compound that's been genetically engineered in the lab for sure. Um, so I, I'm I'm forgiving for those people who do that type of thing, absolutely, and I'm not disparaging it. Uh, for me personally, my journey with that, um, the monetary loss they was costing me to keep up that habit was ruining my life stopping me from moving forward and keeping me stuck where I was. The the frame of mind it put me in, where I was constantly in the now, never planning for the future, and never dealing with the things from the past that I needed to process, meant, for, meant 10 years of my life I was on that stuff, 8 to 10 years. Um, I, was, I was never moving. There was no upward progression of any kind i was just in the same place mentally and physically for 10 years and that stagnation is a waste of of life i think someone described it i think i think it was actually a south park episode or something uh, that says it makes you okay with being bored and that's the problem and we should be active members of our community and and we should be improving our lives at any given moment and growing it stunts that growth eventually if you abuse it too much. It really, it really does. I know people don't like to hear that, um, but I could see it happening in my own life. And the biggest thing that made me realize the negative effects it had on me is when I when I left it behind, and realized I didn't know who I was once I quit. 
a lot of my identity was was mixed in with who am I if I'm not the guy who smokes cannabis? You know, I'm that guy. You know, that's who everyone knows me as. That and my identity was blended with it, which is which isn't good. You know, that's not where you want to be. You don't want to be that guy who gets blended with it. <laughs> Never mind. I've been I've been cut short by the uh, the the uh, the crow there. The the uh, the cockerel's crow. What can I say? Um, I think he's joined us. I think he's trying to figure out some audio stuff right now. So I'll let that um, pan out and we'll figure if we can get all that stuff sorted out as well. But as I was saying there, guys, when it comes to things like cannabis, it's not the worst. But I did realize how much of an impact it had in my life after I left it behind. Um, my wallet was full again. That first of all, that was that was a huge eye opener, how much money I wasted when suddenly that money was there anymore that I would have used to buy a quarter or, or an eighth every week, you know, or, or whatever, whatever. Depends how much I was earning at the time, but a, a huge portion of my wage would go towards this wasteful substance that gave me nothing in the long run. Um, and I also, like I said, realized that all the things I had suppressed for eight years by self-medicating, all the mental stuff that I need to deal with from the past, um, all the, the abuses and traumas that I kind of needed to process all hit me at once. A backlog of of a lifetime of things that needed to be thought about, that needed to be understood, hit me all at once. And I had to do a lot of work for three years sober to process that information, internalize it, uh, move on from it and 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 uh, grow. You know, I had a, a lot of, and it's, it's stunted development in a way. And that's what cannabis can, that's another detrimental effect it can have on you if you if you use it too much and, and let it take control of you, which is just so easy to do, you know. It's easier to just to get high than to think about that problem. And the can constantly gets kicked down the road until you realise you're just kicking another can into a huge pile of cans. <laughs> it's kind of, you've got you've to gotta get dig through all that stuff so, at some point and process it correctly, you know. Um, it, it, and it was heartbreaking and traumatic um, to have to deal with it all so much at once, you know, because that's what it's like. And that's why a lot of people kind of fail to beat their addiction because it's a mountain of work that needs doing internally that they've, that they've avoided doing for so long. So there is that too, you know. Um, but I, and there's many other, I could go on for a long time about that, but let's, let's bring the guests on instead and let's get into the millennial kingdom, shall we? So, uh, Louis, can you hear me? Are you there? Can you hear me, Louis? Are we are we coming through? Yes. Hi, mate. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, sorry, I, I just I was just finishing off a, a little bit of a rant there, but I think I've got you back now. And uh, yeah, so thanks for coming on. You've been messaging me on Telegram for quite a while, haven't you? Just uh, asking to come on and talk about a few ideas <laughs> about the millennial kingdom. So I'll, I'll leave it to you, Louis, and you you tell me what you want to talk about today, and I'll I'll reply. All right, great. Yeah, it's kind of kind of a hodgepodge of some things that I've been working on, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing is finished. It's all subject to change and interpretation, but um, a couple interesting things I found. But before I get into that, I just wanted to thank you, uh, first of all, for having me on, mm -hmm. and uh, the brother before, amazing story. You know, praise God for that. That's incredible testimony. Yeah. So that, was, that was very edifying for me to listen to. I haven't... I had, I. I never went through that stuff, but I know people who did uh, similar substance abuse stuff. So that was, it, it hit home, even though it wasn't me personally. Good to hear. Um, yeah. So let me see. Is it possible for me to share my screen? Um, slides. You can Maybe. actually. Yeah. Let me just make sure I've got the right one up first. If you want to just share that screen now and I'll see what happens. I think, yeah, I think you literally just press screen share. It should be in the bottom corner. Um, and the bottom on the right is where I see it. It's next to chat. There we go. Right. So give me one second. Let me make sure that's just sharing on okay. um, OBS, my streaming software. So I think it is. I think they can see the screen. Yeah. So there, it's sharing now. Go ahead. All right. Cool. So um, I just made this little timeline here. Um, I'm going to start with Genesis 6, 1 to 3. Uh, came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. said... Uh, his the man's days shall be numbered to 120 years. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't take that as literally 120 years because people lived way longer than that after the flood, and mm-hmm. it just doesn't seem like that's a steadfast number. So I like the interpretation that that means um, jubilees, which are cycles of 49 years. Mm-hmm. So that would be about 5,880 years exactly. Um, so I kind of take that and built the timeline off of that. So there's two ways it works here from creation, which on the Septuagint timeline, because I think that's the more accurate one, um, which takes the birth of Christ to about 5,500, between 5,000 and 5,500 years since creation. So if, uh, 5,880 years would be 100 jubilees. 120 jubilees from creation that would take us to about 480 AD and all of these numbers are ish I rounded them all off to fives and zeros just to kind of make it easier um, to see except for all the way on the right 2024 it's where we are so that would take us to about 480 AD fall of Rome roughly 476 around that area Um, and also the verse itself says when men began to multiply on the face of the earth um that this decree went out from God. So it might not be from creation itself. It might be somewhere in between creation and the flood. Mm -hmm. So I just took the year Enoch was translated, which again, roughly Mm 3,850, move that forward 5,880 years till I think it's 2030 that comes to. So that would be right in the future. But again, that's just an arbitrary, I took Enoch's date and that date might not even be correct. But it it yeah. kind of gives us a general idea of where we are, if the Jubilee interpretation is correct, which that might not be either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I just put some on the bottom there. Enoch translated the flood roughly 3150 B.C. Yep. Abram was born about 2000, the first temple about 1000, uh, when Solomon started to build it, not when it was completed. So the seventh year of Solomon's reign, roughly about 1000 B.C. So there's a thousand years there. That's a millennium. Mm-hmm. From the first temple to the create to the birth of Christ, 1000 BC to zero is a thousand years, a millennium. Mm-hmm. And then we look from when the second temple was the um, it, they they started and stopped and started and stopped. When you read Daniel, Nehemiah, and Ezra, so it's one of those dates, about 520 BC to again 480 AD, the fall of Rome ish. Um, that would be another thousand years. And I'm just kind of toying with. From the fall of Rome to about 1480 is the capital millennium. So um, I don't think, on my current understanding, that years were added or taken away to the timeline. Mm -hmm. I think that names and dates were changed and stuff was taken out and maybe put in that didn't happen and so forth. But I don't think we lost maybe all that much time. Um, That's just where I am currently. I'm definitely open to, um, you know, changing my mind on that. Mm-hmm. So that would mean it's been about, if four, if 1480 was the end of the millennium, we don't know when Satan was released, we don't know when New Jerusalem left and any of those things, but it would be about 400, uh, sorry, 544 years of little season, mm-hmm. as it were. And that seems like a, a long, long time for a little season, <laughs> it's like half a day mm. in millennial days, so that might not be correct, but just putting this out there. And then also uh, the many, many Tekel Ufarsen. Um, when you calculate that in terms of numbers, it comes out to 2,520. And I thought it was interesting that the second temple was 520 BC and 480 AD. Kind of, you can add that and take that away. So that may be something that I haven't quite figured out where to place that yet. Because um, Daniel would have been about, I guess, between 600 BC and 520 BC in that area. So when he received that prophecy in Belteshazzar's time. Again, we don't have the exact dates, but it's something to consider and to throw in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one understanding. Um, then on the next slide, I have a completely different understanding, which the numbers are a little bit different, but similar. So I guess before we move on, was there anything that you wanted to maybe address on here? No, it's interesting uh, you've, you've gone for a non-revisionist history approach here, because like I said, most of this people who theorize this do do not believe that there's been as much time as they claim um like i said and things like for example the the space between you said the the millennium of what sorry the birth of christ all the way to 480 ad which was the fall of rome you're saying that was the destruction of the second temple well people would say that happened in 70 ad 
um, and that that time period between 70 AD and the collapse of Rome in let's say 536 roughly or 480 that wasn't as long as they say it actually was it was actually only maybe like and they've like I said orchestrated and invented a lot of false history to make that time seem longer but I've also heard other the- other people theorize other channels saying well no the, the history we have is correct it's just the order has been messed up to the point where we're not sure when things actually happened in the timeline, but the amount of history is correct. So it's interesting to see a timeline that maps out true history as we have have it documented exactly. Um, the only issues I can, like I said, see with this is the destruction of the temple in 70 AD um, and where that would actually fit into this. And when exactly did the millennium begin? So you're saying it, it began in 480 AD. So from this angle, was there a period before the official beginning of the millennial kingdom? Christ may have returned in 70 AD and brought destruction upon uh, the temple uh, you know, and, and everything began then, but the reign didn't begin until 400 years later. Is that what you're saying there? <laughs> Sorry. The dogs have been acting up today. <laughs> um, no, I think, was, it, was it something no, I said? <laughs> no, the neighbor was doing something with her cows in the corral, and they were getting loud, and the dogs, it, they've been on edge since then, so I'm trying see. to calm them down, but uh, okay. they're, they're at a hairpin at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would, well, I guess it's important, I think, with the 70 AD, uh, if I can address that. Sure. The way I see it, and when, especially you can see it a lot in the prophets, it's very clear to see in the prophets that there's the destruction of Jerusalem, which I'm willing to, you know, it's funny <laughs> that we try to look back at history knowing that it's wrong. Just mm-hmm. like how much of it can we rely on and use? And yeah. I hate to even like quote it with the understanding that I don't believe it. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So um, all I can really do is believe the Bible and what that says. So... Um, you know, I, I, it, it seems that the judgment starts at the house of God and the pattern that we see from, you know, really back in the wilderness. But if we want to say from like judges, the book of judges forward, hmm. God rescues his people, sets them in a perfect place, provides for them. And then they rebel. He gets upset with them and brings in somebody to scatter them or to oppress them or to rule over them. Mm -hmm. They cry out because of the oppression, and then he defeats the oppressors, and the cycle starts over again. He sets up the people, they rebel, and he brings somebody else in, and then he gets rid of those people that came in to do his bidding. Um, We see that especially with Nebuchadnezzar, right? He calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant, Mm -hmm. um, that he was doing his bidding to, you know, destroy the temple and scatter the, the Israelites through Babylon. So he used them to do that because they just refused to repent. Mm -hmm. So I think 70 AD would follow the same exact pattern. He used Rome to come in. The judgment started at the house of God, officially scattered them throughout the world. And I think it's Luke 21, 24, that in in the three discourses, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke's the only one where it mentions that, you know, Israel is scattered throughout the nations Mm -hmm. to be a witness until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So I would say then that the time of the Gentiles, with my understanding, is from 70 AD to 480-ish AD, around Mm -hmm. there, 500 AD, if you want to round it. So they were taken out of Jerusalem and Judea, were finally scattered by the Romans at Yazwil. Um, Oh, have we lost him? Oh, it says he's still there. Uh, Louis, I, th- I think we've lost your sound. If you want to just uh, maybe have a look at what's going on there, maybe you've unplugged your your microphone or something. Yeah, the sounds. It says you're still connected though, so I'm not sure. And I can still see your screen as well, so you definitely aren't gone just yet. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, let's just looking at this thing. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, uh, by the way, guys, just as as a, a caveat. Was. Sorry, you you did you cut out there um, for about thirty seconds. Uh, Louis, so you might have to repeat yourself there on that one. I'm sorry. Oh no, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, just uh, just basically that he's he used Rome to scatter the people, mm-hmm. to scatter the the people in Judea and Jerusalem. Yeah, um, he brought his wrath upon them, and then the so-called Day of the Lord, as it's mentioned, mm. is the judgment of 
the nations, the judgment of the Gentiles. Yeah. So those are two separate events that the space in between is the scattering of Israel, also known as the time of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So there, it's just really how long is that time between the judgment of Jerusalem and the judgment of the nations? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at like Armageddon, for example, that's not the judgment of Jerusalem. That's the judgment of the nations that came against Jerusalem. Yeah. So it's, it's clearly two separate events. It's mm -hmm. just the question is how much, you know, how much time do we think happened between them? And the way I'm looking at it here, about, you know, 410-ish. Mm -hmm. You know, if you subtract 70 AD, about 400 years thereabouts. Yeah, I think I heard in the Telegram group not long ago, people were arguing that or speculating the idea. Maybe it was me in response to something like me. I might have been talking to you, actually. But it's the idea of how long is tribulation exactly? Is it Does it last for 400 years then? Or is it... Is it the seven years as we've been told? And what, and is it, does that come into play here? Or are you just saying there was simply a seven-year tribulation just prior to the 480 and the beginning of the millennium? Um, what does that play into this view? Or do you think it was more of a... It wasn't a literal seven years. It was a drawn-out 400 years. Perhaps. How are you interpreting this particular... Because I understand you probably have another timeline you're going to show me in a minute and another idea. So we're not wedded to this, are we, I'm guessing. But, uh, I do. <laughs> yeah, if you could just explain uh, me, that finally. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me skip over that slide and I'll go to this one. <laughs> so, um, Revelation 17, 10, and 11 says, There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. Mm -hmm. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. Okay. So, I'm taking that to mean the, the Caesars. The kings mm -hmm. are the Caesars. So if we look at the left, we have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Those are the five who have fallen. Mm -hmm. Galba would be the sixth who is, the one who is. So if that's true, and this is that with this interpretation, we have within seven months the dating of the book of Revelation when it was written. Mm -hmm. From June of 68 to January of 69. So it would have been right before the fall of the temple mm -hmm. in 70 AD. Um there's here Otho, I guess that's how you would say that. He apparently ruled for three months, but he was never confirmed by the Senate. So he wasn't, he was like acting Caesar, but he wasn't actually a Caesar. Hmm. So if we just cross, he's on the list, but he wasn't confirmed. So if we cross him off, that would mean Vitellius was the seventh who would continue a short space. He only ruled for eight months. And then the eighth who actually sacked Jerusalem, sorry, I scrolled down there was Vespasian. So he was mm -hmm. the eighth um, who would have been, I guess, you know, I want to say possessed by Satan or the beast who was of all of them together, but he was the eighth. So that would be the eighth Caesar of Vespasian. Mm. So getting back to the tribulation question, um, if John was writing this during the time of Galba in, say, 68 AD, mm -hmm. that's about two years um I'm not sure exactly when in 70 AD. I think it was August or towards the end of the year anyway. Mm. So maybe that's two and a half, maybe three years. Um, I'm not sure if we look at three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. It might be talking about that time. Um, the actual siege of Jerusalem happened under Nero mm -hmm. in 66. So that could be referring to that time from 66 to 70 could be the three and a half years mm. around there. And I think the seven-year tribulation, I don't really see it. I kind of think that's an interpretation of the the, the last week of Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, people think that's a seven-week tribulation thrown into the future. Yeah. But I don't I don't see that actually in Revelation. It just talks about three and a half and 42 months. Mm -hmm. So no, I think it, it just might be kind of a remnant. It's a, fascin it's a fascinating timeline you've got here. Obviously, uh, we you're going against mainstream history here because um, supposedly the, the book of Revelation wasn't written by John on Patmos until 20 years after what you're claiming here. Um, so obviously this would have to be, this is in a way revisionist history. Though other people, there's always been speculation over who wrote the book and when exactly. So um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm willing to take anything right now as a possibility. So I'm, I'm fascinated you've uh, compiled this here. I'm just reading through it. Yeah, and I have no idea if any of this is correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just uh, trying to match some stuff up. 
Um, yeah, I originally yeah. looked at this months ago, and I was like, nope, there's nine. <laughs> and then I, I looked into Otho a little more, and like, no, he wasn't actually a Caesar, like technically, actually. Mm. So um, that would be the eight kings, if it, if it were, if it's correct. I don't, I don't know. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, again, was Revelation written after, before? It's, it's, it doesn't say in Scripture. No. So it's hard, it's hard for me to say, you know, history is anywhere near correct. So um, I guess that's just for each person to kind of take this with a, as many grains of salt as they need and do some research and, you know, come up with what they come up with. Oh, absolutely. So do you have another timeline you said here, another idea? Do you have a, a, or is this it? Is this what you've got here? No, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. Just okay. how much we have time to get into. <laughs> no, go for it. Let's just, just share what you can while, while we have the time. I mean, well, what are we on here? How long have I been going for? Let me just check. I've been going for an hour and a half, so we've got another half an hour to go if you want to just keep going. And again, guys, just a caveat, as, as we're explaining here, we're just thinking things through here. This is not like, this is definitely how it is, and we all need to get on board with this one particular idea that we're in this timeline this is just somebody who's been speculating and wants to share his work. That's all it is, right? And that's all we're ever doing when it comes to something like this. Uh, but go ahead, keep going. Uh, show me what else, what else you've been thinking about, because um, I'm always, I'm, I'm always happy to see stuff like this. So go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Yeah, this was not my opinion a month ago or even two weeks ago. So it's uh, it's definitely evolving as we as research continues. Um, so I think Revelation 12 is kind of like from the very beginning to where we are today okay um the timeline on the i have the whole chapter up there with a couple things highlighted but on the bottom on the on the on the actual line there verses one and two i think the woman that is being spoken of the woman in in heaven Mm -hmm. is new jerusalem um isaiah refers to it as a woman it's referred to as the bride of christ yeah uh the 12 the 12 stars would probably be the 12 tribes of israel and and all those things it kind of like also works with joseph's vision of the 12 stars and the sun and the moon being Abraham and I'm not, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob and uh, Rebecca, I think, or Rachel. I always get those confused, but it kind of goes with that as well. So the woman I think is new Jerusalem, uh, verses three and four, another wonder in heaven, not on earth, but in heaven, the great dragon and the fallen angels. If we take that. So at that time they fell from heaven, Mm -hmm. but they still, as we see in Job, they can kind of go to and fro. They weren't, shut out of heaven exactly Mm -hmm. as we see in verse seven here when the war happens so they could go to and fro or at least satan could anyway yeah Um, i think we see in in one of the prophets maybe of ahab or i forget one but one of the uh one of the prophets has as evil spirits lying spirits uh, within the the council of god so it it makes me think that well they can all kind of go up and down like you said even even in job you know uh, Satan was just walking around while God was chilling with the sons of God. You know what I mean? I assume other angels is how I interpret that. And Satan was just there and he just joined in you know I mean? in the conversation, pontificating over Job. And that's where the bet was made, you know? So yeah, I, I, I agree. It, is, it does seem like though he left his first estate and was cast out, um, he still had abilities to, to he was still an angel. <laughs> that, that didn't change his nature didn't change and his abilities certainly wouldn't have changed so i can agree with that because sorry go ahead i'll just interject and then we'll go ahead yeah I, I think personally that there's some property of the firmament that does not allow flesh and blood to get through mm-hmm. so i think anything that was created a spirit probably can still go pass through yeah i'm um, just kind of as an aside with no proof whatsoever but that's kind of how i see it just speculate um, yeah i get it i get it keep going <laughs> that's fine yep so verse three and four satan and the fallen in heaven way back in the day when new jerusalem was being set up um and then verse 4b the dragon stood before the woman new jerusalem which was ready to be delivered of jesus mm-hmm. so and then verse five he was incarnated on earth and before satan could really get his his hooks in there he was caught up resurrected Um, in our glorious hope, and caught up to God and to his throne back in heaven. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, New Jerusalem fled into the wilderness, so I think that means it left heaven and came down to earth. We want to look at the earth as a wilderness, Mm -hmm. just as a general, you know, it's not where God is, so it's a wilderness, Um, where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand, two hundred and three score days. Mm -hmm. So I take those days as years, Mm-hmm. which I'm just starting at 480 AD, if that's when she left uh, heaven and came to earth. I mm-hmm. don't know that, but we add those, and it gets to 1740 oh. uh, AD, roughly. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's when the New Jerusalem would have been on Earth. So longer than the actual millennium, uh, 1,203 score days. During that time, at some point, Satan's released from the pit. And to me, it makes sense. He, know, he knows the scriptures. He knows New Jerusalem and God are going to be on earth. Mm -hmm. So the first thing he does is goes to heaven and tries to take that over because God's no longer there. So mm -hmm. verse 7, he goes to war in heaven to try to take that over with everybody else that came out of the pit with him, the dragon and his angels. But Michael and the good angels prevail. And at that point, which would have been in the past, before the short season began, but after the millennium, um, the great dragon was finally cast out of heaven once and for all, and now he's back on the earth. And at the end of verse 12, it says he's wrath because he knows he has a short time. Mm. I interpret that as the short season, the little season. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, um, of course. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep, I'm liking this. Keep going. So that's uh, on the timeline there. Satan out of pit goes to heaven, finally can no longer ascend. Uh, 12, 13, and 14. At this point, he persecutes the woman, which is still New Jerusalem. So the woman was given two wings to fly into the wilderness. I take that as a separate wilderness, which North Pole, invisible under the ocean, mm. uh, who knows where it is. Um, but she went into her place where she's nourished for time, times and a half. Mm -hmm. I take that to mean 350 years. If a time is 100 years, that would be roughly 350 years, mm -hmm. which would take us to adding that to 1740 to 2090. So again, different numbers, but maybe right, maybe wrong. Uh, I doubt we have that much time left, but maybe we do. Who knows? Um, so just that's my interpretation with there. And so then the serpent cast out out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, after New Jerusalem, that he might try to flood New Jerusalem, right? And mm -hmm. if we kind of think that that's what God did to his children, mm -hmm. you know, during the actual flood, he's going to try to do the same thing to New Jerusalem and to her children on the earth to flood it. Mm -hmm. But God's not having it. He made the promise, the covenant, that the earth will not be destroyed at the flood. So the earth helped the woman, opened up the earth's mouth, and swallowed up the flood. I always thought that meant like a chasm opened and the water just poured into it. Mm -hmm. But it could be like a sponge. It yeah. opened up like a sponge. So the ground absorbed the water, which then turned the dirt into mud, mm -hmm. which then flowed downhill, and now we have a mud flood. <laughs> so it, it wasn't a water flood, it was a mud flood, because yeah. the earth, the ground, literally the ground, the dirt, it, you know, the translation, mm -hmm. it absorbed the water, and then where it was pitched and sloped, we have a mud flood. At yes. that point, the dragon is wroth with the woman, but can't get to her, because she's in the wilderness being nourished. So then he went to make the war with the remnant of her seed, which is us. So he finally, at this point, goes after the people. Mm-hmm. So if we want to say that's the beginning of the little season, maybe, um, I don't know, but he was kept, he went to heaven, couldn't do anything there, came back down, went after New Jerusalem with water, couldn't do anything there. And he's like, ah, it's out of my, both of those are now out of my range. So I'm going to go after the people. And that's currently where we are at this point. He's doing everything he can to make war with the remnants of her seed. And that is us. Mm, that final statement as well which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I have said that repeatedly. We live in an age where you can know Jesus. We have the offer of free salvation still being offered to us. Um, we all, and we live in a world left behind by him in which his laws and statutes and testimony was spread everywhere and available to all as well. Um, and obviously you left behind, you could say all these buildings and the infrastructure for us to live in as well. And, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because you see that these, these, Many of, like, say, Euro, you know, many values of every country all around the world actually have have the basic tenets of God's laws enshrined into their basic laws and rights. You know, murder's wrong, and you'll go to prison for it. Basically, you know what I mean. That's the basic yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? It's kind of it. We all have it kind of written to everyone's laws, and maybe that is the all the nations when left did keep the commandments of God and all Satan's been doing in his little season after his attempts to, to get the city is okay. Well, I'm just going to chip away at what, what Jesus left behind, which is this world where people know Christ and can know him and a world where they have laws. Yeah, I absolutely it, agree. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way he's, that's what we see, isn't it? We see that we see the complete dissolution of family values, core godly values. Um, the re-education of our children, all, all these things, you know what I mean? We're, we're seeing 
the complete degradation of of good good society and the you know the christians have been saying for years we have been saying look at what the devil's doing to us and in a way that's exactly what revelation 17 is talking about there you know sorry revelations 12 verse 17 so yeah this is um i love i love this kind of reinterpretation of of these type of verses through this new lens like because it, it it fits doesn't it in a very eerie tell it telling way like the way you've just broke it down and described it there this this is a testimony that it has already happened to me again it's it's kind of it it because we went at it with the lens okay so has the millennial reign already happened and you reinterpret this whole thing and it seems like this works this actually works and we're living in that revelations 12 verse 17 period you know that this, it feels right to me and uh I don't know. I, I'm I'm rambling now. I'll let I'll let you go, and I think I, I might be annoying your dogs as well from the sounds of it. So I'll let you go. I'm really sorry. They're usually very well behaved. <laughs> they got they got something going. So yeah, I, I agree. And there's always been that idea of like, where does verse seven fit in? You know, because yeah. we know, like I said in Job, that he's been up there before, so that can't be that far in the past, really. Mm. So people put that in the future, and then it's it's all over the place. Uh, but I think that's a pretty succinct. Um, Again, don't know if it's true, hmm. but it helps to kind of read, read scripture thinking with this in mind. Yeah. Right. Like, what would it be? So, for example, Daniel, I don't have a slide on this, but Daniel 4, um, let me pull it up. Here. Yeah, sure. Where is it? D Daniel 4, the vision where Nebuchadnezzar turns into an animal and seven times pass over him. Mm -hmm. If If we read that, with the idea that he's yes i do believe it happened to nebuchadnezzar i take it literally but also if you kind of look at it in, in the spiritual i think he's also talking about satan so the seven times that pass over would be seven thousand years would be the seven millennium of time the seven days of time hmm. and when we look at it he was he was cut down he was the grand cedar that ascended up into heaven and all the fowls of the air lodged under his branches and then he was cut down, but he was left a stump in the earth. So to me, that's him being put into the pit. But he wasn't destroyed yet. He came back up, but he was bound with iron and brass, which would be this. I believe that's in in th the terms of Daniel, that would be Greece and Rome, the oh, iron and brass. Uh, so, by the way, by the way, if you, you're not sharing that right now, if you think you are, I think you might have to. Oh, I think you have to click I'm a new. Sorry. I think you have to click a new screen if you do that, or a new tab or something on the screen share option. Yeah, good point. There we go. Um, I think the visuals are helpful, that's all. I don't want it to go to waste, so I think we should definitely bring it up while we're talking about it. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So it's just here. I have a, I have a spreadsheet going. So, there we go. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so Daniel 4, um, 20 to the end. It just, just for anybody out there, just read Daniel 4, the dream, that the vision that he's given... And it really sounds, again, like it could be speaking about Satan. Because, right, when did he fall? Right, He fell when he's like, "I, this is me. You know, here, uh, verse 30. The king spake, is not this great Babylon, all that I have done, the might of my power and the honor of my majesty. Mm. So that's Satan exalting himself over the Most High. You know, saying, this is me. I will put my, you know, the, above the congregation of the north. I forget the, the verse there. Um, so at that point, he's cut down, and seven times pass over him. He goes to eat the grass of the field, which kind of reminds me of licking up the dust of the earth. Mm. Um, you know, wet with the dew of heaven, hairs and feathers and claws, like he turned into an animal. Mm. The same way that you would think Satan, as a serpent, would have, you know, maybe feathers and claws and hairs and all of that stuff, possible. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the days, Nebuchadnezzar repents, but Satan, we know, does not. So Satan is released, but doesn't repent, whereas Nebuchadnezzar was released and does. So I thought this verse here, um, here, I'm going to try to highlight this. So at the same time, my reason returned unto me for the glory of my kingdom and mine honor and brightness returned unto me. That word brightness there is very interesting, right? That sounds like it's kind of an angelic thing. Mm. More than like the man Nebuchadnezzar actually received brightness. So I wonder if this is like a, a what if, you know, had Satan when he came out of the pit rather than attacking heaven and, 
and setting up everybody for the final battle, like had he repented, mm-hmm. kind of wonder what might have happened if he would have been restored to his old honor, got his brightness and his and his majesty back. But unfortunately, that's, you know, here we are. <laughs> that <laughs> didn't happen. That's not how it went down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, fascinating stuff. Um, there was, uh, I think, I think, was it? Da- I think Daniel, is it Daniel twelve? I was talking about, um, talking about the the beasts and the, you know the 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 kingdoms that would come, um, and I did a reinterpretation on that as well, which was interesting. I just, I can't remember. Uh, let me get my spreadsheet up here. I think I think my screen's sharing with the guys right now, so they'll see that too. But I do have a document. Um, let me just millennial rain evidence I've called it. I've not actually come to this document in a while. Um, if I can find it, there. where did I quote it? Stuff about the day of the Lord, uh, Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah, Isaiah 13. Sorry, that's, that's the thing, though. We need to we need to read it again, yeah, with this interpretation. Um, you know, with fresh eyes. So when people kind of come out against this and you know they haven't done the research, the research involves reading the entire book <laughs> and yeah. any other extra biblical sources and, and reinterpreting and re just seeing it again. Like, well, what if this means this rather than what I've been told? That's it. So, it was Daniel 7. Sorry, out of way. I was way off there. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at Daniel 7 here and, and I'm hearing, I'll, uh, I don't know if I have to share the screen with you as well, I think, just so you can see it. Um, screen share. <laughs> i've got a grant access sorry give me a second it's all over the place grant it's access to skype i'll use my finger for that there we go um i'm not going to quit till we're open let's just try that um, i think it's working now screen share and yeah i'll just share with you daniel seven here um is that working can you see it yep you can see daniel 7 good and i'll bring it up for the guys to see as well so it's when i was reading this i was just thinking about the 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 kingdoms that would rise and the vision that um um obviously the interpretation of this vision and there's just so much in here which which is just a huge hint to you know rome living before and after the millennial reign it talks about the saints and all these type of things and how um, the kingdom that would be given over to them and if i it's, let me try and find it. it says here after i saw so it talks about the fall of the other beasts it talks about all the beasts being animal analogies so you got like the the first was like a lion that had eagles eagles wings and the wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man and man's hearts were given to it. And then it says, The second beast was like a bear. It raised up itself on one side. Three ribs of the mouth, the teeth of it. And so you get these beast analogies like animals. That The third was like a leopard. You know, it had four wings of a fowl. It had four heads and dominion was given to it. And then it says, After this I saw a night vision to behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. And it had a great iron teeth. And it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And it's kind of, this beast does not have an animal assigned to it, which I thought was interesting. It's just some kind of odd, diverse beast of some kind. And I'm thinking about the language of today, you know, how diversity is our strength type of language, and how we live in a multicultural, diverse society today. And I was thinking, this this sounds like our beast today, that with iron teeth, we have a civilization built of iron and metal, more than brick and mortar and stone. Um... And then it says, yeah, I considered the horns and um, they came out a little horn. The first was plucked by the roots and then you had the eyes of man speaking great things. So you have like antichrist analogies here, false prophet stuff going on. And then it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancients of days did sit. And it's talking here, you know, how the, the millennial reign began, basically. <laughs> and his foam was like a fiery flame, wheels burning of fire and a fiery stream issued forth and... You know, thousands and thousands of minutes, minutes unto him, 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were open. So we're talking about he's coming in his power in his kingdom. He's establishing a kingdom here. Then it says, I beheld. And then because of the great words which were horn spake, I beheld the beast was slain. The body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. So this is judgment by fire on, let's say, Rome. I do think this final beast was Rome, this fourth beast. Um, and it says here, 
As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. That's such an odd description, isn't it? It's one of those things you kind of just breeze over and it's, it's pretty difficult to understand on its own until you apply this lens over it and you realize that, well, in the millennial reign, people did live for a long time. And they may not have all been perfected saints necessarily, but longevity was certainly a perk of living during that time, even for those who were not resurrected saints, you know what I mean, who weren't in perfected bodies. And it's, is it possible that the leaders and kings of these beasts and the people who lived through them, they had to live through the millennial reign still? Do you know, and, and their lives were prolonged. And it says here, you know, the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and languages should serve him. So this is the millennial reign, again, a physical one. Nations and languages will serve him, a physical thing on earth. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. When obviously we're not claiming that he's stopped ruling, just that Satan is released for a short season. And like you described there in those, those other explanations of Revelation um it was it was it Revelation seven you were showing there seventeen, um the 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 kingdom flew away basically <laughs> that's what it's described there and the devil chased after it and tried to flood it and it didn't work and now it's residing somewhere so you know the kingdom did not pass away but it's certainly out of sight currently during the little season, um and this kingdom which shall not be destroyed so it's still there and it's still waiting and you know my theories about coming flying saucers and motherships which might appear once ever all the alien brainwashing has been uh, fulfilled people wouldn't recognize the beloved city as what it is if they saw it they would think it was aliens or something and it says you know i grieved in my spirit in the midst of the body in the visions that troubled me um and so you know he got the interpretation of this and it says the great beasts which were four kings you know shall rise out of the earth and it says here, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Um, and I thought this was interesting because it's kind of like you could say, yeah, no, the saints will be apart and rule with Christ with the millennial reign. You could say that. And that's what that's trying to say there. Fair enough. That too. I think it could also be, is it possible that the saints once resurrected took over the beasts kingdoms that were left around and became rulers over them? So this is another theory that I'm speculating that a lot of these buildings may actually have been built by these kingdoms, these beasts, and then repurposed by the saints once the Millennium Takeover happened and taken over and given to the people in, in a way. So there's that too. Um, and it says here, The fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were as eyeing as nails of brass. So I'm thinking bullets here. Nails of brass? teeth of iron a war machine type culture you know tanks and planes and and uh, cogs and burning fuel and industry or this sounds like our world to us you know which devoured and broke in pieces the earth of its resources and stamped the residue at its feet and it had 10 horns in its head and it says here i beheld they made war with the saints and prevailed against them until so this is Rome making war with the saints until, bam, Jesus turns up and judgment is given. And, you know, it was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints instead possessed a kingdom. Are we talking about these four beast kingdoms being given to the saints once the rule is established by it? Once Jesus came and established the millennial reign on earth with the rod of iron, did you just give all these cities of these beasts over to the saints and then those saint sorry those beast kings had to live for an extended period of time seeing their kingdom being ruled by the saints rather than them you know and i imagined you know if that was the case it says you no know, the lives were prolonged basically and they had to live for a while after this um where, where's that verse again um their lives were prolonged for a season and time is this not them living through the millennial reign, watching the their kingdom being ruled by the saints instead? They made war with them, lost, uh, won at first. Jesus came, took it off of them, and gave it to the saints. <laughs> this is what, and this is obviously a reinterpretation based with this new lens. But I think this is how we kind of have to do this. this is, we have to reread everything and see it through a new angle, you know. And and this is just one of those. I say I'm not saying I'm 100 percent with this interpretation I'm giving here, but you see hints of something something odd with it you know that that does mix with this theory a, a little bit more and this whole idea that you know it's the same beast that rose after the millennial reign 
I think these kings who lived through it likely took back their kingdom once Satan took over for his little season. Yeah, and the saints left with the camp of saints, wherever that went, whatever that is. And um, you, you can imagine spending maybe a thousand years or longer watching other people rule over what you built. And then once Satan comes back, he's like, okay, guys, you're with me now. Let me give you everything back. And is, was that the establishment of these Roman, Egyptian-themed secret societies? Were they the, 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 no, the Freemasons and all these Illuminati families and bloodlines? Were these the, the original kings of these places who took back their kingdom once Jesus left? You know, the physical buildings they built. Is that why Roman architecture is literally everywhere on every continent, as it said? You know, Is it because it was this kingdom that was there before and after? after the millennial reign and they kind of picked up where they left off in a way i don't know i mean what do you think of that is it, have you ever thought about that idea yeah i definitely agree that they picked up where they left off um i think we can see that in the scripture there yeah and even in revelation that i pointed out i think that those two chapters the one i had on the slide and daniel 7 kind of mirror each other a little bit yeah they do. that's why um, I, that's why i thought about it when you were saying it. i was like yeah that's I've been speculating myself about that idea and I thought, yeah, I better bring that up. Um, but there you go. And I, that's just something I was thinking about. Just And again, I'm not saying I have it all figured out there at all. I don't. It's just we have to come at scripture with new eyes, with a new lens is, is basically what I was getting at there. Um, and I, th I think you, you seem to agree with me as well. Is there anything else you want to share while I've got you still here for five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah, just real quick while we're here in Daniel 7, verse 14 there where it says that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. That's one of the common objections, I think, that we hear uh, because of Zephaniah 3, where it says he will turn to the earth a pure language. Mm -hmm. So people assume that means all of the languages of the nations will be gone. Yeah. So I've heard that, you know, oh, we're all not speaking the same language, so we can't be after the millennium. Well, it doesn't say that he's taking away the old ones. He no. just, it, the verse says he's giving us a pure language. Mm -hmm. So you can see right here that, that's a millennium verse and there are different languages being spoken. So that, that's a pretty easy one to refute. Mm -hmm. um, let's put it there. Um, I don't know if we have time for the one last thing I wanted to show. Probably not. No, no, go um, for it. Go for it. Let's give it a go. Let's, let's give it a go. That's fine. Um, let me just, all right, let me share it up again real quick. While you're getting right. that up, when you get it up, I'm just need to quickly check something myself. Um, my emails while you sort that out. Um, Yes. And so here's my my attempt at who's the Antichrist. If it's not Nero, which or Vespasian, who actually conquered Rome, uh, sorry, Jerusalem, I think it might be this guy, Pope Sixtus, which uh, means six, literally means six. So, I'm uh, sorry, let me center this. If we look at what John wrote for the famous 660 and 6, um, and then we look at Pope Sixtus, how it's written in Greek, the second and the third letter are exactly the same. And the first letter is a sigma rather than a chi. But um, the earliest writings, which <laughs> they didn't have a reference, use the spelling with the X. So it was literally written chi, vowel, psi, vowel, vowel, sigma. So it huh. could it could just be literally that easy <laughs> that it's Pope Sixtus. So the first one um, was about 115. Then go to the next page here. There was a second Sixtus who was in 257. And I just I put Sixtus into just a translator mm. with the, the sigma and the chi, and it comes out Sixtus or sixth. So either way, and then we see it actually in tile. It's using the X rather than the, the Sigma. Mm -hmm. And then Sixtus the Third, I think this is this guy. So he was from 432 to 440. Um, and he was followed by Leo the First, Leo the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. I think they might be trying to tell us there's something. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Again, and, the, and these are different years that I've mentioned before. This is 50 years earlier than what I was previously talking about. But yeah. in, it's all kind of in that same area. So, and Sixtus the Third. It says, was one of the only popes to use his given birth name. He didn't choose Sixtus. He was born Sixtus, which kind of fits like with the number of his name. His, num his name is literally a number. It's six. And he was the third. So six, six, six. It, it just kind of, kind of flows. Um, 
It just and... it does seem odd that there is this character in history with that name. Um, it, it just yeah. I mean, also well, if you think if you really think about it, you know, if 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 John wrote this book in whatever you want to say, let's say sixty nine or ninety three or whatever the one the historian wants to say it was written, you think as as a leader of the supposed apostolic secession church from that from that group, you would avoid calling yourself. Pope Sixtus the Third, as in three sixes. You, you, you think you would avoid doing something like that, wouldn't you? And, it, it, and it, you have to wonder, like, are they having a joke here? Did this person even really exist at all, or is it all just allegory and they're just trying to like mess with history here? Exactly. And, you know, and you have to wonder because why would you do that? You you would not call yourself no. that. You would just wouldn't, would you? Especially if you're a leader of a church that's supposed to be based on on Christendom, you know, and and. And you know you can trace your line all the way back down to Peter, supposedly. You know if that's the case, then why <laughs> call yourself something which is literally six six six? Why would you do that? Uh, it's <laughs> it baffles the mind, you know. And uh, we just can't look over these things anymore. These things are not trivial anymore. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know how have people interpreted this in the past? We, like, do you have anything else to say? Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm just just a point to that. No, <laughs> brilliant. Um, so this guy, Sixtus the Third, mm. um, he founded San Pietro in Vocoli, which is translated Saint Peter in Chains, mm. and it has an altar here. It, you can, it's in the big picture. It's the kind of the centerpiece there under the arch, but it's literally chains, manacles. the The story is that the Saint Peter, our guy from the Bible, in this city, was locked up, and then through a miracle, was just released and walked out and left his chains behind. Mm. But what if those are the chains that was used to bound bind Satan, mm. and now it's placed in here? And so, just anything's up for debate at this point. <laughs> so maybe those are Peter's chains, and that's really true. Um, or maybe they put them in there later and changed the name and backdated it, and they're making a show of it and saying, "Look, these are the chains I got out of." And you know, I escaped. <laughs> I escaped. You would probably be saying, um, hey, "Maybe." There's a maybe. lot of other interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of other interesting stuff here. It's Moses in the middle and a lot of interesting stuff. And this is what the guy apparently looked like. If we can, you know, <laughs> you can trust any great. Of that, yeah. Yeah. So Pope Sixtus the fourth um, didn't come around to 1471. So that's a full thousand years later. So there was no <laughs> Sixtus for a thousand years. And there were, the millennium was kind of bookended by Sixtus the third and the Sixtus the fourth coincidence i'm sure picking up so with it picking up where they left off like i said <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so he founded the 16 chapel and that's a mistranslation it should be the 16 chapel it's named after him he's mm. the one who made it so it's really the 16 chapel and it was um the next slide i think it is yeah the Sistine chapel is really the six sixelium sixtinium so it's really the Sixtinium Chapel, the 16. Takes his name from Pope Sixtus IV, who held the first Mass there at the Feast of the Assumption and consecrated the chapel and dedicated to the Virgin Mary. We definitely have to, don't have time to get into that. So well, that, we'll that, that last slide you just showed there, if you go back again, sorry, um, it, was, it wasn't just the Sistine Chapel, but also the Vatican Library he established. And obviously, yep. it, is that the beginning of the establishment of uh, let's remove and hide all the books? Let's start hiding this millennial reign very quickly and we'll, we'll, we'll store it in these vaults. <laughs> it's kind of, he had his hand in all of that, you know, that's just fascinating. Sorry, go ahead. Carry on. Carry on. Yeah, no, he needed a place. Absolutely. You'll see it in yeah. a couple slides. It's, you're right ahead. You're ahead of me. I'm ahead of you. Sorry. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to skip through this. This is super interesting stuff. Sixtus the fourth hired this guy, Regio Montanus, which literally means mountain region or region of mountains, mm. to uh, come in and change the calendar. Um, so the Gregorian calendar we have would have been the Sixtinian calendar had this guy not died. But he uh. died as soon as he got to Rome and wasn't able to perform it. But the idea to change the times came during Sixtus's mm -hmm. reign with Regio Montanus. And this guy is supposedly the grandfather of Copernicus in terms of teachings. Mm -hmm. So this guy had the idea of a globe and all that. And Copernicus's teacher inherited those teachings from Regio Montanus, who was then, you know, part of all of this. So mm -hmm. again, don't have time to get into all this, but the Gregorian calendar right here, the planned calendar reform was in 1475. It didn't happen until 
1582 under Pope Gregory, but it was initiated here. Well, just stopping, so stopping, you, later, stopping you there quickly, you're just talking about the changing of times. And it even says in Daniel 7, verse 25, he shall, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And there shall be given unto his hand until a time and a times and a dividing of time. And it's kind of the, the, the phrase, think to change times. But then he didn't get a chance to do it. I just thought that was funny with the way you said that. But sorry, 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 carry on. Go, go ahead. That's, no, that, please. that's neither here nor there, really. That's just something I thought was funny in terms of talking about this in prophecy sense. But, but go, go ahead, go ahead, carry on. Yeah, you're right. Every word, it all matters. It's all, it's all there for a reason. So that, that's a very good point. Um, so this guy, a couple popes later, Pope Julius II, was actually the nephew, the blood nephew of Sixtus. Mm-hmm. Um, and this guy, warrior pope, battle pope, fearsome pope, was not a nice guy. So it says here, it, it, he didn't take his name in emulation of the first Ju- Pope Julius. He wanted to be Julius Caesar. Mm-hmm. So it says, on Palm Sunday, 1507, Julius II entered Rome as both a second Julius Caesar and in the likeness of Christ. So he, he took that day, he could have done it any day, he intentionally tried to be like Christ and like Julius Caesar, the first the first Caesar ever. Mm. So this guy had some thoughts in his mind. And here's kind of what you were talking about here with the Vatican Library here. So this Julius is the archetype like literally who Machiavelli wrote the prince about. Yeah. He modeled it after Pope Julius. Um, and they were in a war, uh, not battles, but the, in terms of the papacy of Cicero Borgia, who on the bottom, that is who in this, you know, most people will probably come across that. Mm-hmm. The supposed image of Jesus is Cesar Borgia, whose father was the Pope previous to Julius II. So what they said was, and this is a quote from Julius II, one of his papal bulls. He says, I will not live in the same room. Now, before I read it, think of what we're saying here, right? So the Pope before, the king of Israel, the king of the world, before this, had a son who is now the image of Christ, right, who was exiled from the kingdom, and then Julius took over, like he usurped him and took over for him. Mm-hmm. So he says, I will not live in the same room the Borgias lived. He, Alexander VI, who was the father, desecrated the Holy Church as none before. He usurped the papal power by questionable devil's aid. I forbid under the pain of excommunication anyone speak or think of Borgia again. His name and his memory must be forgotten. It must be crossed out of every document and memorial. His reign must be obliterated. All paintings made of the Borgias or for them must be covered over by black crepe. All the tombs of the Borgias must be opened and their bodies sent back to where they belong. What if he's not talking about the Borgias? Right? Mm-hmm. What if he's talking about the millennial reign must be obliterated? We must mm-hmm. cross out every document, every memorial of what just happened before we just came back into power after being away for a thousand years. It's really easy to see that in that language that mm-hmm. he chose to use. Um, maybe I'm stretching, maybe not. Um, well, you, you could say maybe oh, and, and, he was actually talking about Jesus there specifically, maybe. Um, but what if he was just t- simply talking about some of the ruling saints? And one of those families of ruling saints was the Borgias, perhaps. Geo, and there is that too. It, again, I'm just trying to speculate here on how we could, because that's that's the thing. A lot of people say, well, where's the evidence of his reign then? There would be some documented history. And I keep saying, they've changed the names of everything. So what we what they're talking about will sound like something else just because they've changed the name, but replace Borgia with Jesus. And that's who he's actually talking about. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like how history books are a lie in a very literal sense. They've just replaced, they can't remove the event. It happened. So let's just change the names of the people involved with that event so no one ever thinks it was Jesus, basically. That's the game that's been played against us here. And this is just another example of it. But yeah, go ahead. This is brilliant. Sorry, carry on. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Um, so then I did this especially for you here. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I, I haven't heard you mention the Swiss Guard. Yeah. Um, they were established by this guy, Julius II. Mm-hmm. He established the Vatican Museums. He rebuilt or built the St. Peter's Basilica, which is in Vatican City, right at the head there. Mm-hmm. And he is the one who organized the switch guard. So if we're saying that this is Satan in the flesh or he's being possessed, maybe he just wanted his old friends back. <laughs> he wanted to be protected mm-hmm. by the people that he was accustomed to the way that they looked. And 
mm-hmm. tried to make the men of the time do that. Uh, yeah. Again, maybe a stretch, but like, why would you dress your guard like that? Like, that can't be like, uh, you know, it's not aerodynamic for fighting or anything. Well, if you've got the internet, like, you big, if, puffy pants. if you have the internet up there, you can type in a Basler Fastnacht, which is a Swiss uh, festival every year. Um, and they venerate the Nephilim. How would I spell that? Uh, Basler, so B A S L E R, and just fast, fast snatch. It's uh, F A S C H, fash, N A T C H, Nash, fast snatch. It's uh, the festival of Basel, basically. Um, and stuff should come up, and you'll you'll see loads of clowns there. You have to quickly share the screen again just to quickly change it over. Uh, yep, loading up. There we go. Bajla Fastnack. So this is what they dress like every year and parade through the streets. Um, they are in full venerated. It's, it's another wild man tradition. You know, it's their version of the Nephilim. But I'm not surprised the Swiss Guard look the way they do and this is the theme that they venerate every year. Um, and this is how they like to dress themselves and what they do. Very clownish, typical big red nose, uh, wide grinning monster there is very typical. That's the most common one you see. And the Swiss Guard seems to be also modelled after nephilim features, red hair, and multicoloured patterned skin. So there's, there's something going on with that partic- particular region as well. Um, and as you can see, the, the architecture there is beautiful in uh, this part of, Sweet- of Switzerland. Switzerland itself is beautiful, you know, in terms of architecture. So maybe it is a mockery of, of a, maybe a hub of the Millennial Kingdom in some way where Christ was ruling. Maybe they've now filled that place with... Uh, representations of demons um and obviously you dress like the thing to channel the thing so this is now a hub for the spirits of the nephilim to uh come every year and channel be channeled you know so there's there's a lot to be said for that for sure and the swiss guard um but yeah um, to have the vatican surrounded with guards that literally look like nephilim nephilim themselves (laughs) is very telling for sure it's odd it's an odd design choice but this is what's going on in that region you know, so it's hardly surprising for me. Yeah, and you would have to wonder why Switzerland was never drawn into the world wars, so-called. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. No one attacked them. Uh, <laughs> That's a little odd. It is, <laughs> it is. And it's also where uh, CERN is based as well. Yep, and if you look into Lucerne Lake, L-U-C-E-R-N-E, there's mm-hmm. a lot of... It's supposedly where a fallen angel fell, and it's kind of mm-hmm. like... <laughs> if you look at it from above, he's splatted like arms and legs splayed. It's just, and that water is filled in. It looks like yeah. you know the person fell there. So it's the was very the, interesting. Was the god? Was it the Gothard? The god? The god? The Gothard tunnel opening ceremony? Do you remember that? Is that Switzerland? I think that was Switzerland actually. Um, yeah, that there's something yeah, going on with so. that place. It's a high. Is it perhaps where? There's a place they're called Apollo or Apollyon or something like that. When next to where CERN is built, is it perhaps where the beast came out of the pit? Is it where Satan was released from originally? There's loads of speculation about what's going on with that place. Why is it? Why is it? Why again? Why is it not involved in any of the wars? You know, um, is it the? Um... Yeah, I think that's in. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I think that's in Revelation too, where where Antipas was martyred. If you look at that, that would be in in the Swiss Alps area. So that would be right around CERN, where Satan's seat dwells. So yeah, that was would, it? Is it? That Gene- would be a biblical thing if, if that's true. Is Geneva in Switzerland? Is that what that is? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, and is it, obviously that's the uh, Geneva Convention was. It seems to be an odd place where they seem to be immune from everything. And uh, is it just not where the leaders of the world, who rulers, who part of Satan's kingdom, get to live in? Ex- abject luxury basically <laughs> it seems like a very luxurious place it's where all the um the bank accounts are isn't it that uh to for people avoiding tax like the billionaires avoid tax they have all the bank accounts in switzerland and all this type of thing and um yeah it's it's it's, it's an odd hub of a place anybody who's from switzerland who's listening if, if that's if that's happening fill me in on all the dark weird esoteric stuff about that place that only you would know as somebody who lives there i'm fascinated to hear it all um, but yeah, I'll let, I'll let you I'll let you carry on and finish up. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm rambling. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, <laughs> no problem at all. Um, this is the Vatican Library or Museum, pardon me, the Vatican Museum, and it looks like they took a lot of stuff off of this building. Yeah, There's no way to prove it, but it looks very like the stripped down version. And they have their little globe there, emerging out of the globe, mm-hmm. with what looks like a pine cone centered on top of it. Uh, a little bit of symbolism there. But the last slide I have here, we'll end on this. There was a Pope Sixtus the Fifth. 
1585. So again, within 100 years of all of this stuff happening. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to wonder, will Sixtus the Sixth be a future pope or a future <laughs> ruler? And could that then literally be six 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 yeah and kind of like bring the whole thing to a you know a little tied up in a bow kind of thing so just wanted to put that in there as a maybe possibly for the future um, i can believe that you know I can see <laughs> you, you know that's going to happen because they're, they're very on the nose these people aren't they who rule the world and are doing all this nefarious stuff they they don't really hide it at all and and this is like this is just out in the open and I, it would not surprise me if the next pope was six just the sixth and that's just going to drive everybody crazy, isn't it? All the all the end times <laughs> tribulation people are going to go wild again. Um, absolutely. <laughs> well, that, that was a yeah, one if, of. If, that, sorry, go go ahead. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you say. No, if if someone would choose Sixtus the third, I'm assuming another person would choose Sixtus the sixth. So it's yeah. not out of the realm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that was a wonderful presentation there. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Honestly, that was a that was a wild ride. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you... Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening. A little bit of everything. Pretty incoherent. Jumped around, but uh, eventually it'll all tie in. Hopefully. <laughs> no. More, I... more people we get research in this, the easier it'll be to put the puzzle together. Yeah, that's what I'm all about, man. That's exactly what I want to do. I just want to hear people's ideas and thoughts and speculations. You know, and obviously the Telegram group is a great place to do that, and this is a great place to way to do it as well. And I, I, I'm happy for people to come on and uh, share their speculations to support this idea and this concept. And, and Louis, I, I really appreciate you coming on to do this. Thank, thank you for taking the time to make that presentation as well. Um, I think people really probably really enjoyed what you... I haven't had a chance to see the chat because I've just been engrossed in what you were showing me. But I, I'm going to assume people enjoyed what you were sharing there. <laughs> I really am. Everyone's saying very interesting. Fantastic, Louis. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so wonderful... Uh, and we'll definitely, I'll definitely have you on again sometime to for another back and forth. I really, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, the Telegram group's great for anyone who wants to join. Very nice people in there, uh, patient, and we don't all, all agree, but uh, we listen to each other, which I think is the important part. So thank you again, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. No problem. Thanks again, Louis. God bless. So there you have it, guys. Uh, two wonderful phone calls there. I, I really appreciate Russell coming on to share his story there and his testimony and some wild stories of his encounters with the spiritual realm and the demonic. And I re really, really appreciate Louis coming on there to share his uh, fascinating insights and research into into these ideas. Again, just speculating, just showing what we can find and and, and seeing, seeing if the puzzle pieces fit because that's what we do. We're piecing the puzzle together. Um, together. That's what we're doing here, okay? We're just trying to piece it into one holistic image the best we can. So thank you for listening today, guys. Just a closing message here. Uh, me and my wife's podcast, Tales Under the Big Top, is about to go live. Um, she has sent me a link to the podcast here. I'll just share that with you quickly, guys. Um, let's go over there to see what's going on. Yeah, it actually premieres in 60 seconds, guys. So if you if you aren't tired of my voice yet, you can always head over to YouTube, as you can see here. This thing goes live in 60 seconds at half past uh, 10 UK time. I think that is about 5 p.m. Eastern time. You get the gist. But if you fancy listening to me ramble on a little bit more, you can always go listen to me and my wife talk about the fascinating and extremely disturbing case of the YouTube personality Ruby Frankie and the uh, the abuse that she's been um, embroiled in with her children who she has filmed for over over a decade of their lives you know uh, making money off them on on YouTube and it turns out she's uh, become involved in a cult it it's dark stuff and my wife explains to me all of the gossip, all the juicy stuff behind all of this and all the terrifying, terrifying outcomes to all of this disturbing case. So if you're interested in hearing something about that, something a little bit different, go over and check out me and my wife's podcast, Tales Under the Big Top. And the link to this show is in the description to this video so you can hop straight over there now guys and go and listen to that as well. I might be in the chat there as well, just chatting away while I'm at it. Give it a go. 
Maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't. It's a bit of a different speed to the conspiracy stuff. Um, we do talk about conspiracy things on there, but we also just talk about, again, these stories from the world, which really do prove that we're just living up under a giant circus tent and the world is just wild. So go check that out, guys. That's starting now. Thanks for being here. And as always, God bless.